Hey everyone, welcome to a very special edition of Digital Foundry Direct Weekly. Yes, after 99 shows of, and let's be honest here, varying degrees of quality, relevance and competence, we've done it. We've hit the big 100 and to celebrate the occasion, we're delivering the biggest DF Direct Weekly we've ever done uh, with all current serving staff members involved in the production to some extent or other. Um, to begin with though, well, this is our weekly show based on the latest gaming and technology news. So let's get straight into it and joining first of all, I'm very pleased to say that we have DF Direct Weekly Series Creator. Yes, he's back, Audi Surly. How is it going, Rich? I am so happy to be back for 100, and I figured the best way to celebrate this is to enjoy some Julian Rignall all-time top 10. <laughs> that looks really high quality there, Audi. <laughs> uh, for the benefit like of those uh, who are listening to the, to the podcast, what's going on there? You're showing a book, right? Or no, is it a game? It is a, a compilation of uh, games. Julian Ringles, okay. in fact. I don't wow. think he made them. The best part about this, though, Rich, is they clearly keyed out, like, red. Or white, sorry, to make red background. <laughs> if you look at his, so his mouth, mouth, it looks like he really has a gum <laughs> issue here. <laughs> instead sure, of, instead you know. of a large tooth, it's uh, yeah, red. yeah, he's just bleeding sure. in his mouth. <laughs> I, that's an interesting release. I'm just disappointed we never got a Richard. I was Ledbetter's gonna say, where 10. is the Richard Ledbetter all time? I was, top uh, 10? I, I was the background figure during that era that oh. basically made made everything happen. You should have released like oh, an all time no. top ten that was co the best compilations, the ten best compilations. So you would have like a hundred. Would be like. I mean, if it was Rich's top, it would just be uh, Manic, Manic Miner. Miner and Crisis 3. <laughs> yeah. Probably, yeah. Afterburner <laughs> on Master System. Crazy oh, Frog yeah. Racing. Uh, we bring it all back here, baby, for 100. The Master System is only the master of evil. That's true. And I'm on record as saying that. Um, I do particularly joy about that particular cover there is the use of the, the gratuitous use of the Afterburner font. Oh, yeah, that is true. Uh, oh, yeah. Look at Julian that. Rignor. Look at that. And I'm so sorry if you're uh, if you're actually just listening to this on a podcast. You're missing just out. Yeah, that's true. This yeah, is a visual show or, now. Or indeed watch the show. You know, I am uh, the Norwegian Carrot Top. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us, we have uh, John Linneman, of course. Yes, I've already revealed that. I've yes. spoken. I brought I brought back the DF Retro jacket just because, you know, that, that's what I, I kind of started that series with. So I felt it was uh, a good idea to wear it today. It still fits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, some, for some reason, dressed up uh, in his funeral attire, we have Alex <laughs> <Yeah>. Battaglia. <laughs> I did have a pinstripe suit, but for some reason I was feeling black today. Mm. Um, yeah, I am also... <laughs> dressed up as well as i can i'm seeing a little bit of schmutz right here so we'll we'll, we'll fix, fix that in post oliver <laughs> so let's uh move on to our first news topic so this is um as usual the morning after the night before um last night sony revealed its latest state of play february 23rd and um yes there's a number of uh, big titles revealed and a whole bunch of trailers <laughs> uh just sort of randomly put together for our viewing pleasure. Uh, John, I'm going to go to you first on this. Where should we begin with this? Uh, I guess we should begin at the, the beginning, right? Because um, PlayStation VR 2 um, had a montage of five games uh, revealed. And um, I guess you could say this is a continuation of the most bizarre marketing strategy for a hardware launch I've ever seen. Low key, I think is uh, hashtag low key is the way to describe it. What did you make of it? Yeah, um, it's it's up there competing with the Wii U, maybe. Though I think Nintendo wow. probably did yeah. a better job there, even. Uh, yeah, the PSVR two is is remains baffling to me because the headset is in, is amazing. They have some great stuff at launch, uh, like GT seven and Resident Evil Village. Yes. But the thing is, is that headset costs a lot of money, right? Mm. Like, and it's locked to the PS five. You need software to really support it, and I'm not saying you need all big names but they base the, the games they rolled out all look fine but they're just like you know random trailers of stuff that could be interesting in vr and i don't think it does a good job of getting people really excited they needed something really big here especially during launch week to showcase it and none of these are it but you know i don't want to knock these too much because most of the state of play was quite frankly not very good in my eyes but these psvr games probably look the most interesting aside from a couple heavy hitters uh i liked the before your eyes trailer did you guys see that where mm -hmm. it seems like it uses the mm -hmm. eye tracking feature to determine like when you're blinking and if you blink your eyes while looking in certain places you move through time mm -hmm. it looks like wow 
Uh, so it does seem like that could be conceptually really cool. Uh, and the others, you know, they look fine. I'm a little surprised at Green Hill VR because it's like, uh, what if Song in the Smoke but less stylized and with some modern technology? The first one, Foglands, like once they showed the gameplay, it looked interesting, but the lead up to the gameplay made no, I was sitting there thinking like, gee, this looks like a hero shooter. I wonder how many classes there are and if there's battle passes in here. Uh, thankfully, it does not seem to be the case. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I I was bummed out in general by the showing. I thought it was fine, but nothing exceptional, which it needed to be to sell these darn headsets. Yeah, it's just bizarre to me that, you know, amazing stuff like Resident Evil Village and uh, GT7 just doesn't seem to have had any exposure from the, the platform holder at all. It's it's utterly bizarre, right? Yeah. I and this is this is literal yeah. game changing stuff. Mm. It's it's incredible. Yeah, yeah I, both <laughs> sorry, I was gonna I, say both go both ahead. those ex- exist in a uh pancake form where they're both on their own good mm-hmm. games, but then they're elevated to a completely different level based upon what John is saying to us, uh, in their VR form, and there's no good presentation or breakout video to show that off from the Sony side right. of things. For their device, it's not like these it's not like GT7 and Village are, you know, like on PC devices at this moment in time uh, for these things. This is their exclusive stuff that will sell the system, yet they're not talking about it in a big yeah. way. It's Village weird. especially is baffling because, you know, it's they completely remade the way the game works, right? And people loved Resident Evil 7 in VR, but it was just the headset. You just look around and the controller game where this is more Village more adapts the Half-Life Alex style approach of everything sort of interacting using your hands right so hand-based uh weapons and lots of complex reload uh techniques and things like that it it just it works really well i want to cover that because uh it's impressive what's your take on the psvr2 stuff so far Audi? i'm curious uh in general i mean i don't play much vr just because i get so motion sick uh but i'm always kind of fascinated by the concepts and i watched john's video on it it was a really good video you know i really look forward to trying uh gt when I uh, visit John in a few weeks. But I think yeah. in general, Sony's, uh, at least on the marketing level, they've always been a little bit singular focused on their uh, output. So I think with the PlayStation 5 being out and then now kind of additional hardware with the PSP to a lesser extent, I guess, but PS Vita uh, yeah. as well, uh, they've always had yeah. kind of trouble getting out the killer app focus on those additional hardwares that they have. So I think this is just a continuation of that, and it's uh, a bit of a shame to see, because I do see a lot of uh, really interesting concepts for VR uh, being put on PSVR 2. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I guess that's all we really got to say about PSVR 2 at the moment. I've yeah. just received my headset. I'm really looking forward to having a go on it. Um, yeah, uh, I guess it's just a case of waiting Start for this. Start with big... Gran Turismo. <laughs> yeah, Resident yeah, Evil that. Gran Turismo. That's, that's what I've got lined up. But um, let's move on to the next part of the uh, state of play. And um, this one, wow, it's not gone down well at all. Um, Suicide Squad. Um, this should be a slam dunk, right? Rocksteady, creators of the Arkham Knight trilogy. Um, incredible um, pedigree and prestige from that studio. And the game that they've come up with is essentially... Um, an, ex- an extension of their own DC universe. Um, however, the concept is, well, it's it's a games as a service, uh, destiny style brawl. What do you reckon on this one, John? Oh, I'm so bummed out by this. This this was crushingly disappointed, disappointing because I am, admittedly, a huge fan of the prior Arkham games, especially the first one. They basically developed what amounts to sort of a Metroidvania style thing with Batman, right? Yeah, yeah. And just the level design, the the sequences you played through, the combat, everything about it, the stealth, it all felt super polished and really interesting and exciting. It was a very fresh game. And even Arkham Knight, which was not as beloved, uh, it wasn't, I wouldn't even describe it as a true open world game. It was a relatively constrained map with levels within it. And it was a beautiful, impressive experience. One of the best looking games of that generation. Now, this this has been in development for so long, but I wouldn't be surprised to look at the credits and see lead game designer, room full of WB executives. Yeah. Because they just like, they're like, we got to get games as a service. It has to be online all the time. We got a generic open world because open worlds are popular. Got to have multiplayer. We need battle passes. <laughs> mm. We need tons of loot. We need cosmetics. 
we need all the stuff and yeah it's gonna be huge but i don't think it's gonna be because the action had no weight nothing to it it was literally just like tossing they didn't show the damage numbers i guess but i think it's gonna have damage numbers by default right alex yeah and completely so oh, it's just one of those things where in the in this day and age i feel like people finally get what makes this type of game interesting you need combat that's rewarding you need exploration that's interesting mm. this is all stuff that's something like elden ring embodies right that challenge there's a purpose to what you're doing in the game and you instantly feel it this is literally just like chipping damage on spongy looking enemies while jumping around with zero weight and like weird music playing and just it feels floppy uninteresting mmo like it's just i i cannot uh, believe how bad the gameplay looked not only that it was all the frame rate was very unsteady it was oh it was, it was so brutal dude. that's kind it of the was... least of its problems ultimately <laughs> but uh, i i just uh, couldn't believe how and what was it the gear score there's that specific thing in there where he's like yeah we've got this thing called the gear score makes your numbers go higher and you can make your weapons look really stupid and colorful and it's all it's just it's all the stuff i hate in these types of games this is like the type of game you stick next to raid shadow legends or hero wars you know on yeah. twitter i'm surprised it's not like a play on your mobile phone version Oh, well, uh, maybe it hasn't I, been announced yet. i think i think you're being a bit harsh there i thought <laughs> no being, i know i i think I, it I sounds exciting it's harshness it's harshness really out John. of disappointment right yeah, yeah. like because I really loved Rocksteady's games. Mm. I really loved it. But like I feel like WB's stuff lately has just been... They've been pushing all this stuff down our throats. I don't want it. And it, it sucks. It doesn't <laughs> feel like the type of game that this should have been. And after all this weight, like I don't understand what's going on here. Like It just... Mm. It, does it, it, did feel I think like, it's gonna... it did feel like the game that Gotham Knights should have been. And we weren't particularly keen on Gotham Knights anyway. No. Um, no. But what Gotham. I will say, I mean, I did watch the behind the scenes stuff that they were, that they put out simultaneously with the gameplay trailer. And, you know, there were, there were, it was good to see the developers. It was good to hear the thought process uh, yeah. behind what they're doing. And I do think it deserves a chance simply by virtue of the no, fact. No, I know. So, uh, they use the word game, progression right? though. I don't know. They, <laughs> they said like, it's like, cause when I'm playing Arkham Knight, oh, well, no, sorry. When I'm playing Arkham Asylum, like that classic game, mm -hmm. It's not about progressing stats and no, all these no, things. Exactly it's about all. actually getting through the environment, uh, getting through encounters and things like that. And it seems like a lot of the DPS RPG elements that are tacked into games uh, are about kind of circumnavigating core design principles about enemy placement, mm -hmm. um, about uh, like, uh, how do you call it? Like paper, scissors, rock kind of rock, gameplay. Paper, scissors, yeah. Rock, paper, scissors kind of gameplay where it's about choosing things tactically in the moment versus uh, upgrading meta elements. And I think that's something that just is a huge disconnect for John and I when we yes. look at games like this. And also to me, the biggest disconnect was the emphasis on gun and ranged yeah. gameplay for, I mean, I barely know anything about DC. I know Rich knows a lot about this. I bet Audie knows a lot more than I do. But <laughs> when I think of Har Harley Quinn, I don't think about her just shooting a minigun while jumping in the air. I oh. really don't. I always thought she had like a baseball bat or well, something. She has some sort well. of silly hammer. Yeah, yeah a hammer. A mallet. Like, uh, yeah. Well, I, let's, yeah, let's, but they didn't show this off. Let's put it Fundamentally, the, su Alex, the Suicide Squad isn't particularly noted for its flight abilities. Yeah. But there, are, there is a lot of flying in this game. Yeah. <laughs> no, see, the big thing is, is like, this is a game, again, where you're pointing a reticle at an object and you're <laughs> holding the button and all the upgrades do is make the bar drain faster. That's that's it. That's what you're doing. That is boring. That is a bad design. I hate it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm, I'm really harsh here, but I'm absolutely crushed by what they've shown here. I will give it a chance, but at this point... Oof, I, is, I don't is, know. my question to you john is there a table in the immediate vicinity that you can flip <laughs> maybe maybe well no <laughs> I can't. The there's, too many C there's too much too many crts on on I, I can't put the <laughs> hardware no I, yeah. I i will i will give it a chance but it's just there everything you're saying about it is exactly the opposite of what I wanted. It's challenging it. to give it's it... It's not for me. It's not for me. It's challenging to give it a chance when the core precepts behind the game are, are things that are actually failing in the market at the moment. Yeah. Avengers... That's yeah. going to be my point. Yeah, it's just... Yeah. yeah it's a step, it it's is a step like, back, but... 
I think John hit it this on is... nail on the head, though. I think this is a executive from the IP holder decision and not so much a Rocksteady uh, decision. Yeah. WB. I mean, it, the, I guess the thing that sort of started to turn it around to me was uh, when the behind the scenes thing kicked off and it's Sefton Hill there, you know, the guy who's, the, you know, one of the masterminds of the Arkham trilogy. So, you know, there is that prestige from the studio. I, I still think they've got it. It's just a case of how the final game is going to shape up at this point. But man, yeah, that's, it's a tough call because, you know, basically the games as a service has been, you know, they've been dropping like flies this year. You know, it's, it's. Yeah. I kind of looked at it like games as a service expect the players to engage what amounts to gambling, right? Mm -hmm. But they also require the developer to engage in gambling because they're, tr if they hit it big with the service game, you stand to make a lot of money. I get that. But as we've seen time and time again, most do not hit it big. Like what, maybe 5% actually pull it off <laughs> Feels like a, and yeah. become a success. And if you look at those things that did become a success, how many of them were just done from this? It, it all feels more organic, right? Like somebody put out a game and it just happened to resonate with the right people and it becomes a smash hit. If you try to engineer a success, it usually doesn't work. And I think that's what they're trying to do here. That's what we saw with uh, the Avengers game. Like it's it's a waste of the amazing talent at these studios because I will I will say at least one thing about this that's positive the cutscene direction the animation work the facial stuff all of that was extremely well done and compelling that looks it looks cool I thought I like how that stuff looks uh, but everything else yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and about to sort of uh you know thrust a stake through the developers hearts but man you know if if they put out an arkham knight remaster tomorrow that would sell like millions of units <laughs> it would immediately <laughs> oh, man. oh boy uh, let's move on to more state of play stuff john you wanted to talk about wayfinder oh uh, well <laughs> i man i feel i'm being so negative in this episode i'm, I'm sorry guys it's all right but I, I saw that video as well and i was like they just start talking like we've got online multiplayer and we've got artwork that looks like it's ripped out of a, a blizzard game that everybody's copying in the mobile space and we're running around and slashing at things with life bars and numbers are coming off and damage numbers go up and there's a big open world oh my god what am i even doing i'm sorry listeners this is i i'm i'm feeling like a crotchety old man right now well you know, okay. your hacker games. alias is dark 1x and things have definitely taken yeah. a dark turn this is true this is true i i feel I, I hate saying this kind of stuff you know i want to see these developers succeed and deliver interesting stuff and fundamentally though i have to realize at some point that stuff like this isn't actually made for me and that's okay right there's a <laughs> lot of games out there there's plenty of stuff to play uh this one doesn't bother me at all because it's i'm not the target audience right the only reason i'm so bothered by uh previous one is because i was excited for it where with this it's like okay I'm sure this will work for some people. I think one okay. of the things, too, that makes it slightly frustrating is that it feels so oversaturated, this whole market. And you already yes. made a point that, like, so few of them actually hit it off. Um, but, uh, yeah, they just kind of blend together for me. And you've literally talked about this a hundred times now because it's a hundredth show. Uh, but yeah, it's, just, it's the same thing all over again, right? So it's not for us. Yeah. Wait, though. Hold on. Who... I see Digital Extremes mentioned, and I don't... Uh, like, oh, there's another studio attached as well, Okay, too. okay, because they did Warframe, I don't know if they're right? publishing. Yeah, I'm not they self-published that, didn't I'm not they? super into games like that, but I will admit Warframe was probably one of the better or best ones like that, and it's still going on today. It actually had an interesting style, and, you know, the, the thing that sort of gameplay hadn't been worn out yet, I suppose. But, okay. Yeah. Well, let's try and be a bit more positive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Audi Street Fighter 6. Yeah, this You're is quite excited by this. Yeah, I love Street Fighter and this uh, seems to be hitting all the right notes. These character trailers continue to just be fantastic in terms of just choreography and uh, setup. And I think the visual style is finally kind of hitting that point where people are satisfied. Because Street Fighter 4 and uh, 5 kind of had this slight misstep for a lot of people, I think, where it was very inked lines and things like this, and that's still retained, uh, but the lighting and composition overall in the scenes are much better here, and so every character just looks like they pop out and they're fantastic. I'll say something that's a little bit off character for me, though, that I think the lighting in this game uh, is slightly confusing and somewhat 
bad. It seems like the light always kind of shines from the top and that there's way too much focus on the actual characters, so they pop out too much and the backgrounds kind of suffer from it. They get mm -hmm. washed out and kind of too blank for me, uh, whereas Street Fighter 2 and uh, 3 have fantastic and detailed backgrounds and translating that into 3D is something they've never really been able to do too well. And it seems like they're kind of continuing that here with, uh, I'm not a big fan of lighting. If you look at the cutscenes too, it's like they're, they're, the top of their heads just like shine uh, as if they use too much <laughs> yeah, acne. Yeah, I, I lighting. <laughs> you're lighting. I get exactly what you're yeah. saying, Audi, but I wonder if it's a slight, um, a push for the developer to make it so that people play on uh, competitively on something that isn't just the gray mat zone with the the bars on that it, you know, could like be. Uh, um, uh, so because they're trying to make because like usually people play on those it, in the back back in the old days it was actually I think on like Xbox 360 is performance related partially, yeah. but on um, I think like for the most modern games. Um, they maybe want to have it so that you can only really focus on them and the background is just like a small bonus. I just think there should be uh, a balance to that then, a better balance than this because uh, the backgrounds really... They do glow. Yeah, they, the characters <laughs> look like they kind of float in the space mm -hmm. uh, in front and the backgrounds are mere suggestions of what could be there. It looks projected I, and I would like the does. characters to actually inhabit the worlds they're in a little bit better and Street Fighter 6 so far I think that's the graphical issue that I have with it but the characters are extremely well rendered and the updates just the art direction on them is fantastic they showed off Kami and Sangeef and uh, they couldn't look better especially Kami I'm really a big fan of uh, the kind of mm -hmm. updated look she has. Lily as well. I really like yeah, Lily's Lily too. Yeah. She's really cool. And fighting that stage with Blanca wearing that weird beans onesie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was freaking amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's also uh, talk about Resident Evil 4 because, you know, if this isn't one of the biggest games of the year, I'd be shocked. It looks phenomenal, right, John? Oh, yeah. Now, this one I would say looks fantastic. Obviously, there's always concern when rebuilding a classic game like this, but Capcom's been doing generally very well with doing so, and this seems to be a continuation of that. I'm a little surprised at how, I hesitate to say spoilerific because this game is a known quantity, but they really showed a lot from this, right? <laughs> All the way up through the island scenes near the end, and uh, but it really showcases what they're doing visually and gameplay-wise. There seemed to be a lot more Luis in here than I remember from the original, yeah. <laughs> which was interesting. So he seems to be a more important character, perhaps. Which I don't mind. Which is not a bad thing. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, fighting the two El Gigantes or Gigantes or whatever. <laughs> the Chainsaw Ladies. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just there's cool stuff in here. I wonder, though, John, if they're showing a lot of the kind of known stuff to surprise us with what's new. So that there is this kind of Very emphasis possible. on what you remember from the old game but when you actually play it it's going to subvert a lot of your expectations uh, i wonder if that's why they're kind of making this as you say spoilerific um yeah the, the very well suplexes are back though baby i love that yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh, we're getting vr support for this one right yeah that's they also said that which is interesting and i mean resident evil 4 vr on the oculus quest is extremely beloved mm. And if they can offer something similar to that in here, that would be fantastic. I think they also announced the mercenaries is returning, as you oh, would okay. expect. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I think this is going to be a fantastic release. I just I'll be curious to see that last gen version though. My guess is it's going to have an uncapped frame rate and be very unstable. Yeah. What do you want? <laughs> I, I'm actually a little bit curious if they are going to offer VR. Uh, if they're going to offer also a first person mode. Uh, because what they've been doing with the like the previous yeah. games offering third person modes, I'm very curious about that. Mm. I, I think it's so got to be selectively um, tacked on if they do that, though. I don't know. Oh but yeah, probably. I'm probably. curious, John. Where do you think they go from here now after four? Because that's kind of the final of the mainstream. Well, Rezies. I'll be. I I would love to see Code Veronica, yeah, I but say. I don't think they're going to touch it. Yeah. Why not? I so, they just seem to keep ignoring Code Veronica for some reason. It's a game that it, it has occasionally bubbled up, but it's it feels like it's a side game to them, and it kind of is because it was developed by Next Tech with help from Capcom. But they did not. It wasn't a fully internal game. They did but they, three, right. and that was kind of a less, not lesser, but it was a but, slightly smaller that, production than what two. That was, was an internal Capcom production, right. though originally, right? Mm. And also, that was a game that could really benefit from a remake. Yeah, you know, even though I wouldn't say they 
completely pulled it well, off. Code, code Veronica wouldn't benefit from um, a remake? I think it would absolutely oh, benefit absolutely. from yeah. a remake, <laughs> but uh, Resident Evil 3 was a lesser game in many ways, I would say. Okay. I don't know. I, I think they're going to remake Resident Evil 5. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Uh, sort of honest. Resident Evil adjacent news this week that uh, Shinji Mikami is leaving Tango Gameworks. Obviously, he was hugely um, influential with Resident Evil. Yeah. Uh, what yeah. are your thoughts oh, yeah. on this departure? Uh, I think it's been slightly expected from at least internally uh, somewhat. Uh, he has talked about this before a little bit. And I think when, uh, I forget her name, but the other studio lady that uh, she made her own studio in the end. When she left, oh. and I think that kind of uh, extended his time at uh, Tango. But I think he's been looking to do smaller productions and more personal projects. I wasn't too uh, too surprised about it. Um, I'm excited to see kind of where he goes, but I do have a feeling, considering uh, all the others, that uh, it would probably be something like Net East or Tencent uh, involved. Oh. That Goof Troop 2. I would love to see Goof Troop 2. Uh, John and I famously <laughs> met Mr. Mikami, and uh, I went up to him and said, I'm a huge fan of Goof Troop on Super Famicom. And <laughs> he was very happy about that. Uh, but no, I think he's going to do smaller games for a little bit, and uh, I wouldn't expect it to be horror involved. I think, from what I've heard, that uh, he wants to kind of explore other um, game Interesting. projects. Um, let's round off our co coverage of the state of play by talking about some games that caught our eye or where we have various notes. Um, Humanity, John, looked really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah, so that's uh, another game from the guys that did uh, Res and Tetris Effect VR, basically Enhance, right? And this is actually a game that apparently had been announced quite a long time ago. Uh, I'd forgotten about it, but it's coming PSVR, PSVR 2, PS4, PS5. It basically looks like weird stylized lemmings. Yes. Right? But with like thousands of uh, humans on screen and like this dog that seems to act as the cursor, sort of. Yeah. Like you're running around <laughs> in 3D and guiding them by <laughs> placing things in the world to guide them in the correct direction. Uh, this looks like the Lemmings 3D that I had always wanted because actual <laughs> Lemmings 3D is not good. Oh, you shut your mouth. Um, <laughs> it is not good no it's all, it it's is not awful. very good <laughs> this looked like a uh, so, eric chahi game you know what i mean like oh yeah bit, and stylistically yeah. i could see that yeah that that is really cool mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. oh, I love that uh that one part where they show some of the characters that are in full color and detail yeah. but then there's other ones that are all monochrome and like low polygon count with like these very angled edges it's I don't know what's going on here, but it's, it looks awesome. Mm. Certainly intriguing. Mm. Um, we also had another trailer for Chia, which, um, yeah, we loved the first trailer. And uh, this one looks just <laughs> as good. We also got a release date for this. It's also, you know, pretty soon. I think it's the end of March. So quite excited wow. about that one. Yeah, it looks Probably good. get some coverage, I hope. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Baldur's Gate, who wants to tackle that? Alex? Alex. Uh, so I've been uh, following Baldur's Gate. I haven't actually been... There's been chances where I could have... There was the early access version, uh, but I kind of was really busy during the time, <laughs> so I didn't get to try it out. But I've been excited for it because I actually do like uh, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 and a lot of these other kind of D&D-inspired uh, uh, games in terms of how their battle systems work. But I will take john's words from his mouth here it does not animate necessarily in the best looking way no. uh, as they're showing it off here it's more like the old games were kind of also like this too where it's like you look at the world from the camera perspective and everything's sitting still it does look really nice from that way but then like the characters animate and combat starts and it's just like okay it's a pretty simplistic kind of system there uh in terms of how it visually looks at least yeah, i think I I think the modeling and materials are fine here. Yeah. It's just mainly the animation uh, that is letting it down. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't actually recognize it initially and was joking about it. Like, man, with this animation, it reminds me of the original Dragon Age. And then it re and it's like, oh, wait, this is actually Baldur's Gate 3. That kind of makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't move very well, but I'm sure the game will be excellent. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's sort of summarize what we thought of this state of play. I mean, when your sort of um, showcase title doesn't hit the mark, when PlayStation VR 2 is, you know, sort of broadly overlooked, just a few trailers, um, there's some good stuff in there. But ultimately, 
came away a bit disappointed. And certainly the uh, presentation of the content is lacking compared even to Nintendo Direct. I just don't think, you know, at least Nintendo Direct, it, you know, you get your trailers, but at least you get some kind of context as to what you're actually seeing. Um, and obviously Microsoft's Developer Direct was like a full scale production yeah, yeah. which which put the developers front and center it had a point to it um alex thoughts on this uh i would kind of uh prefer if there was less titles and uh because there was a lot of trailerification mm. that happened in the beginning of it with the vr stuff like just like john was saying it was hard to communicate the the vr experience in like those short set of trailers that were there uh they did a good enough job but i think vr is I don't know. Maybe there's a way to crack that or go at that in a different direction. I would have just preferred pr- perhaps less titles in general and a more focused look. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you thought? Yeah, I wish it, the show just felt a bit more personal to- towards the games and the developers. It feels very, you know, run by the mill trailer showcases. And uh, I mean, it's still early in the year, so there's going to be. They're going to be reserved right now to show off what's coming until early spring summer so i'm not too surprised mm-hmm. that like we didn't get like a big blowout or anything like that uh but the show is still f- very lacking compared to its competitors and i do hope that they kind of figure out uh, how to give a little bit more gravity to some of these games because that's what's really lacking mm-hmm. absolutely john yeah. uh i mean i was overall disappointed with it but there was some decent stuff really? there as well you didn't sound that disappointed <laughs> really? No, I, I if, if anybody from Rocksteady's watching, I I can apologize for being perhaps a little bit overly harsh, but uh that's kind of like my snap judgment reaction to it, where it's just like, yeah. Like I want I want to see them succeed. It's just I'm sad with what we're seeing right now. Yeah, I think you know the the key thing is when you actually get the game in for review you want to be excited, you want to be hyped about what it is that you're about to be playing. And Marketing plays a key role in that, and um, thus far yep. the marketing is kind of actually making us more averse to the game. You know, it's like, okay, this is this isn't really what we want. Hopefully, they'll turn it around with the actual title, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, let's move on to the next news topic. Um, obviously, there was massive drama at the beginning of the week as Microsoft summons journalists to Brussels uh, to talk about um, its acquisition of Activision Blizzard. We don't really talk generally about the uh, various shenanigans that have surrounded this deal because fundamentally it's it's not our beat. But there were a couple of interesting tech stories that emerged from um, the uh, <laughs> from the press conference that. Uh, that we were all summoned to. And uh, I guess, first of all, before the actual conference began, I was quite amused that Phil Spencer basically tweeted that he was in the room next door playing Hi-Fi Rush on an Xbox <laughs> Series S. It's kind of like <laughs> just a, a very interesting move. And uh, he sort of left it to the uh, uh, to the suits in Microsoft to deliver the news. Uh, the first thing was uh, a couple of deals that were announced. Um, The big one was an agreement with Nintendo to put Call of Duty and other Xbox titles on the Switch for at least the duration of the next 10 years. I say Switch, more specifically, it's Nintendo platforms. And obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about whether the Switch could actually run Call of Duty. Um, I'm sure they could run a Call of Duty on it, but Microsoft was talking about a fully featured Call of Duty experience, which basically means, you know, what whatever they've got lined up for this year and the next, Mm. bearing in mind the timelines of this deal. John, what do you think about Mm. this? Yeah, I mean, I I think when they say that, they'd probably be referencing whatever Nintendo has next, because with the way the current Call of Duty engine has been architected, I just don't think they could easily get that working on the Switch, right? It's starting to struggle. Well, it is struggling on Xbox One, and it's it's, yeah, there are problems on PS4. It feels like the games themselves are just starting to push beyond what a system like the Switch could offer without seriously retooling. Because I can't imagine the developers themselves actually had considered Switch, uh, no. or at least it was not a real commercially uh, viable product for the. No, I guess it's viable, but they they hadn't thought about actually developing it. So, but I do think that. The smart play would be ensure that the next generation of Nintendo console has Call of Duty parity, at least feature wise with the bigger brother versions. And in the here and now, if you will, uh, I think 
they should bring classic Call of Duty games to the Switch. I mean, it's probably too late to to implement that now, right? Like at the end <laughs> of the life cycle. But imagine like a Black Ops collection, or at least like Black Ops One and Two, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, right? that would that would sell gangbusters for mm-hmm. sure. Modern Warfare trilogy, they could do it. Yeah, yeah, they absolutely could. What worries me is they're talking about getting Call of Duty on a hundred onto a hundred and fifty million more devices, which kind of has to include the current switch to make that number viable. Mm. And it screams, "Oh, Ooh. we just stick it on the cloud." Please, yeah, don't. Don't do that. <laughs> don't don't do that. I mean, it's probably viable. I mean, there's a number of issues with this. First of all, it's is highly dependent on you having a good internet connection. Uh, but more to the point, every cloud game we've seen on the Switch has been pretty disastrous mm-hmm. at this point. You know, we looked at them. And uh, secondly, for, thirdly, there's a there's a basic hardware issue here, which is that the Switch's ha- uh, ha- uh, Wi-Fi hardware mm. is, is weak source. It's really Bad, poor. Yeah. Mm. So you have to be literally sitting on top of your router or very close to it to actually get a playable oh experience anyway. <laughs> of course, Rich, remember... Call of Duty was on the Wii. Just saying. The Wii? That <laughs> was. A little controller? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, yes, it was. Uh, did it actual was... facts, you know, the uh, Call of Duty engine was 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 running okay-ish on, on the More Wii back in the day? It, had, it was, you know... Fine was enough. All right. <laughs> you, did the, you did that GoldenEye retro play. Oh, yeah. That was actually pretty cool. Uh, oh, that's my case. Yeah. <laughs> um, Alex, do you think the Switch can run Call of Duty? I guess the next gen version, quite possibly, if we're looking at a modern GPU. Yeah, and... I'd say that. Uh, I'd say that is definitely a case. Switch 2 could run whatever next Call of Duties are going to be, um, I would imagine, very well. Uh, it's just more like the old Switch. And based upon what we've seen with the most recent Xbox One outings <laughs> in Warzone, I don't... I mean, that's just Warzone, though. Maybe maybe it would not be fully fledged and it would maybe be a little bit pruned in some ways, like not all game modes are available. In which case, even though the campaigns struggle when it comes to cinematics in certain areas, maybe they could make them uglier <laughs> well, i mean they could make them even uglier <laughs> and you know th- there are like ld10 models out there that you could throw into the game and it's you're selling call of duty and well may- you know, maybe like microsoft is promising feature complete but you've just added a new feature <laughs> yeah. U- ugly ugly mode ugly mode yeah log 10 the u word log 10 <laughs> any, any thoughts on this audi no. I mean, from a from a strategic perspective, this is about alleviating concerns that regulators have about um, about the competitive nature of um, Microsoft taking over the franchise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you, the first thing I started thinking about kind of was cloud service uh, for Call of Duty on current Switch, unless they could like pull a panic button or someone to like do something. But I don't think so. Uh, you could probably pull it off, but it wouldn't be pretty. Uh, which uh, maybe it's not that important when you run around uh, on handheld, but I would think most people would want a complete experience. Um, But yeah, uh, as you said, I think this is much more about a a sense of transparency and also a willingness to work Mm -hmm. with uh, competitors to not create that monopoly that uh, Sony is so uh, eager to prove. Mm. So, and um, Mm -hmm. yeah. There was a second element to the uh, to the presentation to the press, and it was the fact that a deal has been struck to alleviate Nvidia's concerns about the deal. And mm. um, it looks like all of the Xbox titles um, that have PC versions are set to debut on GeForce Now, which I think is uh, well, Nvidia's got a great deal there. Mm-hmm. To be honest, mm-hmm. um, the service is awesome. It is the first cloud system that I'd actually be quite happy to use on a day-to-day basis. The 4080 tier product they've got out now, um, perfectly viable of producing really good 4K 120 HDR um, gaming, which is which is just phenomenal. So the idea that you'll be able to play titles like Forza Horizon 5 there. Oh, and the latency side of things is also excellent as well. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. NVIDIA have actually got a really good deal here. And um, I'm curious as to whether there will be some sort of Game Pass um, client available on GeForce Now, which would directly uh, compete with Microsoft's xCloud offering. 
Um, any thoughts on this one, Alex? I'm curious if Quantum Break is going to be on there and which version of Quantum Break it is, the DX11 <laughs> or DX12 version. I'm very curious. Uh, well, one would think it would be the Steam version, which is... Uh, I'd hope so. Which is D <laughs> DX11. I mean, this is the yeah. part where you wouldn't want the Game Pass version. <laughs> <laughs> you would not want that Game Pass version, no. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, yeah. So that's that's actually pretty good news. I guess the key thing is still whether Sony can be brought on board. And what we saw earlier in the week was essentially an isolation strategy, which was Microsoft basically announcing to the world, hey, these guys are all really keen on it. We've got deals in place, no objections, let's go for it. And then there was the concept of um, highlighting Microsoft's um, weakness in terms of market share in Europe and global market share. I mean, it's kind of been known for a long time now that there's a, a two to one advantage, PlayStation to Xbox. And uh, that was the basically validated by Microsoft's figures. Um, although it was interesting that global market share seemed to completely omit Nintendo. <laughs> a different plane of existence. Yeah, they, they operate in their own dimension, <laughs> their own timeline. Um, yeah. I think that's all we've really got to say about that. Um, let's move mm -hmm. on to the final news story. This one's Alex Central. I really mm -hmm. want to see a video about this. And I know it's really difficult, Alex, because your schedule for the next well forever is stacked. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like, honestly, the game. So I almost do want to say I want to do this next week. We'll talk about it. <laughs> just, to be, just to be clear, we're talking about a modification for Half-Life yes. that adds ray tracing functionality. Yeah. Yeah, this is one that's been teased for it, at least this is the a year real and a half, half life, now. Alec. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should start the video that way. Um, but yeah, the this is um, from Soul Team Sven uh the mod author of Doom Ray Tracing. He did also Quake as well, Path Racing, he? and Quake as well, and Serious Sam as well too. So yeah, yeah. Uh, this person's just going back through the catalog of games. Um, for some of them, I actually understand how they're done because there's like just open source ports of these versions of the game. But Gold Source is an engine that's been closed source for, his, uh, even though it's called Source in the name. I don't think there's ever been a release of Gold Source source code to do this kind of thing, to my knowledge. So maybe I have to read up a bit more on that. Uh, but I don't think, so I'm very curious how this is being done, but it's it seems to be even more intense than Doom RT yeah. uh, because it's going through the entire game. I've also seen that there's uh, things like there's like actually a lot of changes here uh, and it, it seems very bespoke i'm very excited to check it out there's other games that are on our radar to cover just because they'll probably be bad and we need to warn consumers about them uh <laughs> to say a little bit i've heard some things about wolong and i've heard some things about like dragon and other games on pc oh, no. um that that need warning labels attached to them well, but let's, this whoa, 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 whoa. let's actually look at them first okay yeah. okay 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 well yeah we, we can look at them first but I mean, they may or may not yeah. need warning labels. <laughs> they may or may not need warning. But this is one that I would love to do ASAP. So look out for it. I'll definitely come. I think you should do it, Alex, because I'm really excited. Uh, for, first thoughts based on the footage that's been uh, that's been released here. Uh, uh, I think uh, the one thing that I thought that I didn't expect to see was that there was like an implementation of like volumetric lighting yep. uh, in a lot of scenes that I. I mean, technically, I could have guessed maybe that would be done based on what was done in Quake, but this seems here like it's like attached local lights and things like that. It doesn't seem just like a sky value that was implemented. So it seems like every single area of the game was like hand tailored, which is really cool. Okay. Yeah. Audie, I've got to bring in your opinion on this because uh, last time we did <laughs> coverage on one of these path traced uh, remasters, um, Alex was accused of ruining retro PC gaming. Uh, by highlighting it. Uh, what do you make of um, modifications like this? You know, do you find it offensive or fascinating or what? I find it super fascinating. There's absolutely nothing wrong with modifying these games to have a new life and uh, a new look, so to speak. Uh, so, no, I, I'll give you a hug, Alex. I'm, I'm totally in with <laughs> yeah, this. Uh, you'll give it a hug. I mean, I'm, what... Yeah. <laughs> You can still go back and play the originals if that's the case. Well, that's the point, isn't it? It's yeah. not replacing it. No, not at all. No. Unless it's GTA. Not at all. Then, then they replace <laughs> it. Then it kind of replaces it. But, yes, uh, unless yeah. there's legal action involved and uh, DMCA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's <laughs> better than DPS, I guess. 
I'm still uncomfortable with that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I'd really like to see your video on this, Alex. So, yeah, hopefully Mm -hmm. we can cram it in. Uh, But I guess that's all the news we've got to talk about this week. So um, we're going to move on to supporter Q&A now. Now, we've actually got two supporter Q&A sessions. First of all, with the panel we've assembled here. And then a bit later on, we're going to be bringing in the rest of the Digital Foundry team for a massive celebratory Q&A session. Uh, which we've already recorded. Um, (laughs) Let's move on to the first question, though. This one from Leftist Hominid. If Audi is being held in Richard's basement, wouldn't he still be living overseas, i.e. across the North Sea? So to put this into context for non-supporters, you've just uh, put out a DF After Dark talking about your, uh, uh, your, your experiences of living in several different countries that's not your native homeland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know... The whole basement thing, I, sh- I should say that... Um, it's real. Well, my my, ba- my basement has been acquired by the Embracer Group in a six-figure deal. <laughs> and yet so, there's only a cotton uh, plate down there. <laughs> I think the idea is to do... No toilet? I think no the toilet. idea is to is to re- redevelop it and then uh, sell it onto Amazon for a seven-figure After I'm deal. dead. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, absolutely. Uh, we did that at the F After Dark episode. Uh, it's like several months delayed, but it came out. And uh, it's one of our uh, most popular releases so far on that series. So I really uh, mm-hmm. uh, I really appreciate people uh, giving us feedback on that. So me and John sat down to uh, talk about uh, living overseas, which was... Uh, uh, we learned a lot about each other, and uh, it was really fun. So it's uh, some of the content you can get Indeed. on DF uh, Patreon. Did you learn dark and disturbing, intimate contact oh, details about Oh, it was dark and disturbing. Uh, <laughs> dark and I lived in Brazil, you have to remember. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so but, I mean, that's where I'm mostly inhabit now, is uh, Rich's Basement and the Patreon, because <laughs> you have to actually pay to enjoy me, which is only fair, considering the history of my love life. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Man, this is going dark. <laughs> this is going dark. Uh, let, let's move on to the next question, which bizarrely also seems to be from Leftist Hominid. Um, oh. And uh, he, he's talking about um, Legends of Zelda. Um, can we potentially see performance differences between Logan and Mariko Switch systems in Tears of the Kingdom, given that the game is quote-unquote too big for Switch? Um, so I guess this is another question that requires some context. Logan and Mariko, Mariko, they're two different generations of Switches. Uh, the latest one has uh, a processor that's on a smaller process node, and it enables more battery life. However, the memory was also changed and um, it's lower latency memory than the original Switch. Now, I did do some performance comparisons back in the day and Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild specifically, in those really heavy forest sections, there was some evidence to suggest that it actually ran better on the more modern hardware. Fleeting Mm. advantage, but it did seem to be measurable. Um, Could we potentially see performance differences well, potentially, yes, because we haven't seen it, never measured it yet. <laughs> Reminds <laughs> me of the uh, Xbox One S versus the original Xbox One, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but even less of a difference. Yeah, even less, less, even less, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll certainly, uh, you know, possibly give it a look. It's going to involve playing the game on two different Switch systems for what is almost certainly going to be a very small difference, but a difference nonetheless. Have you done that before? Mm-hmm. Have you kind of focused on Logan and Mariko? system differences um, like once very very yeah. once right? in when we reviewed it okay. when we reviewed the new yeah. system mm. and it, you know you, there was quantifiably a difference because the new memory has lower latency so yeah yeah interesting stuff um next question jedi mind trick on you says <laughs> congrats on 100 you guys deserve all the success in the world which is a lot of success if you think about it. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> when you see performance differences between PS5 and Xbox Series X on third party titles, thinking of missing RT reflections in Callisto Protocol, less stable frame rates in Hogwarts Legacy, etc., what do you think is the re- what do you suppose the reason for that is? Do you think developers sometimes put more resources in one platform versus the other, or is it just random or perhaps some other issue I'm not thinking of? But you would know maybe API stuff or hardware differences. So this is this is an interesting and slightly disturbing scenario, right, John? Where essentially we have two machines which have been proven to have been of broadly similar capabilities, 
and yet we're able to see quantifiable differences in titles like Callisto and Hogwarts. Do you have any theories as to what's mm. going on here? Yeah, those aren't the only ones either. There's some other no. stuff that's being mm. tested right now. Uh, it does seem to, weirdly enough, aside from one, it's very common with Unreal Engine 4 games right now. Mm. Um, I've actually asked various developers about this, and they've been somewhat baffled by the situation. Uh, and it has been suggested that perhaps, like, one hypothesis is that with the PS5 having its own unique API, whereas Box is basically built around DirectX 12, that it might vary depending on which team members are assigned to do which version and that's uh, interesting things like that just related to the management of the project um because i haven't heard any specific complaints about the uh the development side of things on either xbox or ps5 well that's a departure right because right? at launch there was a lot of issues um coming back about the uh, maturity of the development tools yeah yeah early on, on xbox Early on, Two absolutely, years, yeah. it was like that. But uh, in you know, in recent times, I've heard that it's less problematic, perhaps. Uh, although there does still seem to be a preference for the PS5's API. Mm. Um, so, but honestly, we haven't actually done any of this development ourselves, right? So we can only really rely on on what other people have done, and it is a little bit confusing because even in like uh, Callisto Protocol. It changed a lot. You remember the pre-release version that I first looked at was running like sub 20 FPS on Xbox. And then they fixed that for launch, but then it was still missing RT reflections. And then they added RT reflections, but they were like much lower resolution than PS5. Mm -hmm. When you look at the actual hardware, uh, that shouldn't be the case, right? Like no. it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> spe spe uh, specifically with raid facing you would expect the um the larger gpu on the series x to actually exactly do better yeah right? i think there's 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 like two things here just from coming from the pc's perspective we deal with this all the time where it's really obvious that a lot less resources and attention are given to pc versions hence why they launch with debilitating stutter when even you know you'd really have to be not paying attention to allow that to get through your your QA or QS process uh, from a managerial perspective. Um, so it's really, I think a lot of it is down to time, budget, and management decisions that have nothing to do with the competence of the individual developers themselves. And it's mainly like, we gotta get this out for a certain date. And based upon the fact that every game is patched into oblivion these days, as soon as it's launching or just before launching or after launching, um, that we know that games all come in hot and there's priorities for ones that have a lot more sell date for, for sure. Um, but I think, uh, uh the two edged sword of Xbox since Xbox one at least has been is that it is a direct X based system from looking at developer, um, documents almost essentially we know that you can run basic dxr 1.0 or dxr 1.1 code on an xbox um series x and series s now that is essentially the black box version of dxr which doesn't allow you to tap into what um essentially is better on amd hardware would be to kind of downgrade quality and use very specific optimizations for example for like the traversal of uh, the ray tracing making that custom for the game or for like a scene or something like that something that we've known developers can do as there's a separate level of the api where you can actually do like completely custom uh, ray tracing work so if you just throw like a dxr 1.0 version of the ray tracing onto xbox series x but for ps5 actually instead due to the fact that it has a different api in total do the low level work that is required right. to even get it running there well then you're going to have two very different scenarios where one where you invested a bunch of work and one where you actually almost just ported pc code over there with not much difference and one will obviously run better than the other because sure, there yeah. was more time given to it so it's a double-edged sword of working on xbox where on xbox one you could literally run dx11 code on that thing uh do you think the xbox one processor was good at running dx11 code no nope <laughs> so it, like that's like there's this like scenario where like it's easier to develop for on some level but at some level that means you don't spend as much it's time just, there's it. also weird situations like another game that i think oliver is covering right now which uh has horrendous stutter problems on xbox but not on ps5 
Okay. He said something what like 800 millisecond stutters at points or something like <laughs> wild like that. Okay. Uh, that's like what? It's not good. Doesn't yeah, baffling. So hopefully that starts to get under control. Okay. Uh, let's let's move on to the next question from Esteban Artavia. Uh, congrats on getting to 100. Kind of a two in one question. Given the review delay situation on Hogwarts and compared to other occasions in which you are not told about a day one patch <laughs> that fixes many things, which scenario do you prefer the most slash least? Given the financial implications of releasing the videos later versus wasting hours redoing work due to a patch, aside from the obvious game running perfect on review code. And on a similar note, have you ever considered doing shorter unvoiced videos, maybe even using shorts as previews, side content, or just for games that are not that not necessarily warrant the full DF breakdown style video? So to, to condense that, basically, you know, what's been happening re recently is games are arriving in the review period unfinished. And if we start to produce a technical pr uh, critique of a game, um, it could rapidly become um, out of date by the time it actually reaches the user. Or mm -hmm. in the case of High on Life, where it launched in a really bad state, so the day one experience wasn't great. But by the time we'd actually finished the video for it, um, it had been fixed. So he's asking, yeah. um, you know, what we should be doing there. Should we just wait or should we go ahead and produce content? John, thoughts? Hmm. That, that's very much a case by case basis. I'm starting to think that when we see something seriously wrong, uh, one of the key things that, to do is essentially go to the developer as we often do and sort of present our findings. It's good to give them a heads up for that sort of stuff. And, and that also tends to give us insight as, into whether it could actually be fixed reasonably quick or if it's something we should expect will not be fixed, right? And that can help influence whether we decide to push forward with raising those points in the video or just wait a little bit until, uh, you know, there's something else. Or like something like Dead Space, for instance. Like I still did did an initial video on that, noting the problem with VRS, but essentially noting that yeah this will this is planned to be fixed and by the time we do our platform comparison video uh we'll look at it in that fixed state and instead we're focusing on other aspects of it because you know you can sort of hold off on certain parts of the video right like the console comparison or the performance analysis stuff that can that can be delayed and you just focus on other aspects of what makes the game impressive right or mm. interesting not always impressive but you know what i mean Right. <laughs> Alex, what do you think about this? I mean, the one thing which I find quite interesting is um, uh, Esteban here is talking about the financial implications of releasing the videos later. I don't actually think about that at all. <laughs> we're, mm -hmm. we're doing all right. I mean, obviously, if Hogwarts Legacy video had gone out on day one, it probably would have done twice as good as, as it did. But ultimately, if you're putting out bad data or or, you know, data that's going to be um, superseded uh, within days, we're, we're wasting our time by sinking in tons of effort into that content. Yeah, it really is at that point in time. And uh, I think there's also like psychological damage <laughs> when you have to redo content oh, yeah. uh, because it's been changed by a patch. Uh, because almost all your, you could invalidate almost all your B roll, which is basically that's, replaying the game. That's again. what happened on uh, High on Life. We couldn't, you know, we. I actually think in retrospect, we should have put the video out because it did include critique of the actual game that was fixed. Mm. But mm -hmm. the point is that all of the surrounding material that John did for that video was out of date and not representative of the experience people were playing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, the problem there was that the B-roll with the unpatched version was so bad looking mm. that it just showing that at all during the video makes the game look a lot worse than it is after the patch, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, I would have had to go back and recapture everything, which is, like, hours and hours of replaying the whole game and getting footage, and it's, it wasn't worth it. So that actually went out as a video to all supporters, but it's not something that we wanted to put out publicly as a statement of what the game actually plays like or looks like. Exactly. Yeah, that mm -hmm. was tricky. Mm, definitely a, a tricky one. Um, I still think that the, the problem is, right, that if we sink all of this time into a video and then it's fixed, we're, we're under pressure to do another video. And then at that point, we've actually got other games or other projects we want to do. And um, yeah, I think the current approach of 
seeing if there's a if there's a problem or if it's in you know clear that there's going to be changes on day one we should wait even if it means we make far less money on the content um because the alternative is to put out bad data that's not really what we do but i do think in you know what we showed in the case of dead space was that you can actually do a video that doesn't concentrate exclusively on performance data and stuff like that and platform comparisons but does actually provide a critique of the overall project and that is absolutely fine right i think that works don't you think john yeah i think so okay um that's it that's all for, uh, the questions we have for this particular part of the supporter q a there's a massive one with all of the other team members coming up imminently but i have a question and it's for audi surly oh no all right <laughs> Go. No, it's really simple. Um, you know, we've done a hundred of these shows now. This was this show was essentially your idea. Yeah, hundred shows in. How are you feeling about it? Do you think it was a good idea? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you brought me in a couple of years ago to kind of do two things, right? You want me to revamp the Patreon to kind of give uh, a more natural and beneficial uh, content line for our most loyal supporters, and you want to figure out how we could. Um, essentially fill in the Mondays, uh, which were very yes. hard on us. Remember? Uh, yes. We'd come back on Monday haggard and just be like, I don't want to work. Uh, so <laughs> for me, when I started the show, uh, it was kind of essential that I find a way to help you guys uh, and also figure out what I was seeing when I joined was you had done some DF Directs for special occasions already. Uh, it was kind of a concept that you had done, but not really looked too much into. And uh, when I was kind of in the meetings and just around you guys, what I noticed was like the actual friendship and camaraderie was uh, uh, one of the best I've ever experienced in the industry. So I wanted to highlight that in these shows. And I think we've been very successful. I think that's why people do gravitate toward this show is that uh, it gives us a platform to be ourselves and people enjoy seeing people um, talk and, you know, enjoy what they do in life. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm I mean, very proud of I'm it. I'm really happy. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of it too. And I'm really happy that it's actually working because one of the key reasons why I was reticent about the whole idea of doing like a, a weekly show or podcast or whatever is that it is totally unscripted. And um, a lot, well, you know, I think Digital Foundry must be one of the most misrepresented um, channels on social media because mm. people basically take what we say out of context to you know justify their viewpoint or to cast shade or whatever and so the concept of actually not being able to meticulously think through what we're going to be saying and putting out there was actually quite daunting and challenging and it has backfired a couple of times but yeah. overall <laughs> i think it's it's uh it's sort of worked out pretty well over 100 that, shows John? it's been incredible oh, would i agree with that yeah it was a little daunting uh i'm I'm known to put my foot in my mouth on occasion. That's that's for darn sure. Uh, so you know it doesn't always. Well, work you know out the, the hand best. doesn't always talk to the foot. Alex, the foot. Uh, Alex, yes, thank you, this. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but no, overall, I think it's been it's been a fun show to do every week or most weeks, and I, I like sort of the the levity that it brings to yeah. the channel. You know, we get a little bit of fun discussion in there, talk about stuff that we may not have been able to speak on in a normal video, mm -hmm. and also just kind of get our own thoughts out there on things in a different way. Uh, and I, and as somebody, like, when I gravitate towards a certain channel or podcaster, you know, I enjoy listening to them talk about things like this. So I'm happy that people that watch our stuff you know, are interested in that same kind of thing, but for DF, right? Like, so mm -hmm. I see the, I see the need for it and I'm happy it's worked out. Okay. Well, I guess that's it. I guess that's, it's for part one of the show. Anyway, what's coming up next is an explosion of, <laughs> of DF Direct Weekly 100 questions from supporters. And we're going to be bringing in um, Oliver, Tom, Will, the whole team is represented in this, in this episode. And I'm very, very happy about that. But yeah, I guess we'll just crack on with that then. Welcome to the final part of the show, this 100th edition of DF Direct Weekly. And it's something a little special. We put together a um, AMA. Our supporters can literally ask us anything. And we've got a big bunch of questions to go through. And in order to be as comprehensive as possible, pretty much all of the core team is here. 
So <laughs> um, let's let's go. And uh, we're going to start with the first question. And it is from Joe Esposito, who's a big presence on our Discord server, puts together all manner of hilarious graphics, uh, including the graphics used in this direct. So uh, yeah, uh, hello, Joe. And here's your question. Happy 100th, guys! <laughs> Exclamation point. OK, here we go. Uh, there's actually a big bunch of questions here, so let's try and rattle through them as quickly as we can. Alex, if you could pick a studio to develop a brand new Turok game, who would you pick? If a Turok film was announced tomorrow, what actor would you cast in the lead role? Okay, so for the first question, I did think about this, and I was originally um, kind of thinking, oh, I would go with the classic FPS design studio, something like id software for example because they've shown that they can reboot an old franchise it was one of their own at that point with doom and they could do it with a new spin on it and with reverence and all these things but then i actually thought about who's been taking care of turok so well ever since it's kind of faded into obscurity and it's night dive and the reason why i would actually choose night dive for them uh, to make the new game is because they've shown actually uh given the right game and the right circumstance they have the chops to like create original content that's really awesome looking for example for doom 64 they had a second uh i think two episodes in between the end of doom 64 which lead up to the beginning of doom 2016 that they added in that were kind of building off the old ideas of the original, you know, Doom 64 wad with just like new content in there. And they played it off perfectly. And based upon what they're doing with the, the System Shock remake, essentially, I think they could do it perfectly because they understand atmosphere. They understand, you know, just all these cool game design things that made a good old FPS. They're not just about remastering games. So I think they could do it really well. And for the uh for the actor question for a Turok film i think uh i was originally going to say someone like adam beach or any of the tripartite of well one of them died in orig originally but of like the actors from the last of the mohican uh i always loved uh other than obviously i, I probably wouldn't want to have um what's his name in it because we're trying to be representative here of native american peoples in the united states but either way um i originally thought of doing a really like famous actor or something like that for a turok role but i think it's more interesting if turok is played by someone who's kind of unknown because turok is a mantle it's not actually a character it's just some random person that becomes the turok and i think it's cool if it's like a coming of age role for some new actor or actress even uh so i actually want to say just have someone i don't even know for that Okay, uh, that was a very <laughs> detailed answer. I thought about this. But, but you are very much into Turok. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the next one, which is going to be slightly tricky. Uh, Tom, what did you think of the Suspiria remake? And I know you haven't seen it. <laughs> that, that question quite Nips difficult. out in the bud. <laughs> uh, but Alex has seen it. And, uh, but, but I guess he can chime in later on that. Related question, what dream director and game property would you put together if you could? Uh, dead directors can be included in this answer. That would be an interesting production process. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, to answer the first bit, I have not seen Suspiria remake. I've seen the original, and uh, Alex and I were talking about this earlier, so <laughs> there's, there's no way we can really say much on that. Uh, Alex, have you seen the original Suspiria, and how did it compare to the... Oh, okay. It's very, very different, uh, just in terms of tone and everything. Um, yeah, it's very, very different film. <laughs> Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, and for the second bit of the question, I was thinking about this on the walk uh, back, back here to record this. There's two genres which I really love to see, uh, like directors who are like, uh, uh, well, at, at their peak anyway, uh, like Ridley Scott with Alien and I think uh, John Carpenter with uh, The Thing, those sort of eras of those directors if they could like be in that mindset and bring that kind of mentality to d developing horror in a video game space, that would be amazing. That would be incredible. And uh, kind of my other thought was, uh, we do have a fair amount of this still, uh, but sort of something along the lines of a martial arts adventure. We've had it with Shenmue, but uh, there's a director I've been really into recently with uh, called um, uh, Lao Ka Leung. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He was uh, part of the uh, Shaw Brothers um, production company when they were starting up in the 60s, 70s. Oh. And he was fantastic. He directed Drunken Master 2. He directed a whole bunch of great, um, like, Heroes of the East, 
36th chamber of Shaolin. And uh, he would be amazing, uh, you know, just as a, a director. Bring these almost like, you know, be like a tournament style uh, uh, template to a, a martial arts adventure. And, you know, it'd be just incredible to see that mentality come to the video game space as well. But it's, uh, yeah, I don't know if they're still still working. I know John Carpenter's not really uh, <laughs> these days. Ridley Scott is hit and miss these days, I think. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, that's kind of my answer. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, don't worry about getting pronunciations wrong. Uh, I apologize for it all the time. Or you can do what Alex does, which is to put on a really heavy journey. <laughs> Just say it. Mumble it out. <laughs> Um, the, the, the next question from Joe, he's, he's really uh, cramming them here, in here. John, name two or three dream cars you would own if money was no object. Also, what is your favorite factory car color? This should surely be a simple one. Oh, man, there's so many cars I love. Uh, some some that would be interesting. I've always wanted a, a BMW Z8. Have you seen those? Yeah, it was in uh, one of the Bond movies. Yeah, it's, it's a rather uncommon sort of uh, two-seater convertible that's uh quite beautiful and rather uncommon and it would be neat to have one of those on the higher end i would love uh, uh the ferrari la ferrari that's one of my uh favorite supercars beautiful looking design and then on the more classic old school uh maybe something like i don't know a nissan skyline r34 gtr okay from nice. like you know late 90s early 2000s that's just kind of a you know but if I if I really had to get a daily driver, I mean, I'd probably get something like extreme. I don't know, like uh, <laughs> so, something extreme. more comfortable, you know, like a nice uh, Rolls Royce. <laughs> <or something. laughs> wow. wow. Okay. So okay, you know, but that very different wants and needs there, right? As for fa as far as favorite color, I've always had a. Okay. I always like uh, sort of the pearlescent white with uh, oh. like black highlights, like black sunroof tinted windows just kind of a, hasn't hasn't the proliferation of tesla model 3 with that exact configuration put you off well i don't think it looks as that great i mean it looks fine on the tesla model 3 I've got one. It, it looks fine uh i i prefer the way it looks on on a different car well, okay. not not to uh, knock we're... not to knock the model 3 because the problem with the model 3 is it is a good car but they're everywhere now like i literally dr true. drove by like 10 of yeah. them parked within like a small little area. And I was kind of shocked by that. So mm -hmm. it's just like, man, yeah. these things are everywhere and it kind of loses something, you know? Yeah. I mean, the problem with the, that is that the paint quality on the Tesla is quite uh, problematic, but the best quality paint is the white one, which is the default color and therefore the cheapest. Yeah. Uh, Joe's next question for Will, what type of coffee roast do you prefer? What country served you the best cup of coffee? <laughs> Wow, this is you love you love your coffee, don't you, Will? I, I do love my coffee, but I'm still kind of a newcomer to the whole like espresso scene. Like I got an espresso machine maybe a year or so ago. So I'm still kind of figuring stuff out. Um I wanted to shout out Extract Coffee in Bristol, who do like a really nice kind of very standard middle of the road medium roast, which is just really perfect. I have it in like an oat latte is my like go to drink. So that's really nice. Um, in terms of which countries serve me the best cup of coffee, like pretty much anywhere in the world nowadays that's reasonably metropolitan can serve like a great cup of coffee. Uh, the only place I haven't had a great cup of coffee yet is like the north of England, which Whoa. for some reason you <laughs> only get thrown. like, I know, sorry, I'm, I'm like, I'm literally from there, so it's fine. Um, no. but whenever you, I order a latte there, it's always like a hundred degrees and you just have to wait like 30 minutes to drink it. And I don't understand why because I make it at like 65 or something and it's, it's crazy anyway. <laughs> but I had some really good coffee from uh, Yunnan in China and I'd never had anything from there before and it was a surprise and it was really nice. So oh, yeah, okay. give that Man, a I, I got this coffee from Hawaii that a friend of mine sent me once that was just amazing. Ooh, nice. But uh, I kind of figured, Will, that you would have been into that civet coffee. Are you familiar with that? Oh God, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> Isn't that the one that's like extracted from some sort yes. of animal feces? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. That doesn't sound like the animals are having the greatest time, maybe, if they're Probably being forced not. to ingest this. I don't think so. Let's let's not do that. Okay, Doug. Uh Oliver, what is your favorite part of the content creation process? Writing, filming, editing. Is there one aspect you find more fulfilling than the others? I think for me it would have to be uh, playing the games. <laughs> <laughs> what the fun? The bit, fun bit. Actually. That's about usually about half of any given video for me, and it just you know it's fun, especially if you get like a good project like um, Metroid Prime Remastered or something like something really that you enjoy. Um, you can just play through that just like you would normally and have a great time with it, and get like lots of great panning shots and kind of really indulge in it. And at the end of that process, you feel very satisfied, I guess, conversely, <laughs> you know, I've had some recent experiences with games that get like come in really hot and have uh, very fast and frequent patches that change performance. And that's yes, not fun. That, that is problematic. <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit of a yin and yang, but mostly it's that's the most fun part of the process, I'd have to say. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot going on with patches at the moment. I, d I can't think of how many projects we've had to remount or redo. Uh, because of you know a new patch comes up and everyone says well you know oh, your video is out of date whatever uh, we're trying our <laughs> best there um, the final question is to me from Joe and uh, it's rich uh, it's actually similar to a question from Luke who says what is something you would like to do on the channel but for some reason didn't do yet and Joe's question is rich uh, where would you like to see DF go do you prefer it as the smaller more artisanal group it is now <laughs> or would you like to see an expansion of the endeavor also do you actually like pickles or does the discord meme amplify an existing <laughs> distaste of the food um i quite like good pickles mm -hmm. um the application of my face into them not so much <laughs> but you know it is what it is uh as to where df where i'd like to see df go it's basically um it's all about the team really and the team don't want to uh um make it anything other than it is now which is everybody working remotely and doing their own thing and it's not really possible if you think about it we can't you know if we were going to make it something bigger and crazily large you'd follow the linus model and he's got his his office complex he's got his labs and that's something we just can't do because we all live in different parts of the world and the actual amount of candidates to do the work we do is so vanishingly small i mean oliver's pretty much the only one who's come up in the last five years kind of sort of means we can't really do more in in the Linus sort of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. model. What it does mean, though, is that, you know, we'd like to do more, you know, I think we said in the Patreon appeal video we did recently that we'd like to do more PC. We'd like to do more retro, and it's all about finding the people that can actually do that stuff and bring it home. Uh, but it, it basically kind of limits the size of the endeavor and the shape of the endeavor. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I'd like to do, but um, it is just a case of uh, resources and actual talent to, to, to do it, which is uh, a very serious answer. But there it is. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, next question from Sibilicious. Happy 100th, everybody! Exclamation point. It's been a privilege to read and watch your content for over 10 years. Uh, my question is, what do you enjoy the most about each other's video? I think we should probably go around this one quite quickly and somebody, we have to pick out um, a point, uh, you know, one person and the point that you like, otherwise we're going to be here all day. So I'm going to start and I'm going to start by uh, talking about Tom Morgan because, oh. um, yeah, I mean, you know, basically it's 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 really not easy to do the the, the stuff that we do and to do it at speed and to be accurate and to kind of withstand the pressure i mean this applies to everybody really um but but tom's kind of very data driven and if you're not bang on with the data uh then you're kind of in <laughs> in trouble mm, right oh yeah yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Being tom, there. <laughs> your uh your, your your thoughts on this one yeah for sure uh, it's been like a trial and error process of getting the time uh, allocation right for every project and knowing where to call it on, you know, how how much time do we need to invest in this. And these days it's kind of like being quite clear with the number of platforms, modes, like permutations, the patches. Uh, yeah, that Hogwarts one, wow. Yeah, so if, exactly. if I was to ask you, um, 
to pick one of your team members and the thing that you enjoy most about what they're doing, what would it be? I think it's, uh, well, I'll, I'll pick Alex. I mean, it's like, I, I had d dabbled a tiny bit in the PC space before uh, you arrived, but you kind of nailed it in terms of setting out what you want to do with, uh, you know, making it clear to people what every setting does. I get asked in the office in Brighton here, you know, uh, what are you talking about? What <laughs> What is V-Sync? What is ray tracing? What is this, that, and the other? And I'm, I was like, actually searching. I was uh, uh, YouTube videos. And I was thinking, we have videos for this, and they're mostly by you, Alex. It's really Thanks, valuable man. to people that's really coming nice. in. Well, that's an interesting point, right, Alex? Because um, our PC coverage before you came along was limited, to say the least. It was kind of hardware, and that that was it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's actually a big story to tell on PC. And as we've noted many, many times on this channel, the PC tech press on YouTube is awesome for hardware. There's so much good stuff out there. But nobody's actually really talking about games other than making bar charts about how mm, well they run yeah, on particular yeah. processors and graphics cards. Yeah, so that's why the search for someone to help us out has been, you know, it's looking for people that do that. We're making thing. progress. We're making progress, though, which is great. <laughs> and I'm very yes. happy. Mm. Hopefully we'll talk about that soon enough. But So you can you can take on this I'll question this next, one. then. Uh, so uh, <laughs> conversely to the uh, looking at games like I do, I think Will has done something that I could not do because uh, I don't have the patience for it. And I don't think I have, um, I mean, I have an attention to detail for certain things visual, but for like organizing You, you hate benchmarking. I hate benchmarking. <laughs> uh, as Rich knew, we tried to benchmark, uh, we tried to do a benchmark video with me right after I started and I just like completely flatlined on it. It was awful. Will, on the other hand- I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, sorry, just to interject there, uh, uh, Alex. Yeah. You got the ARC A770 early, yes. right? <laughs> and Intel were quite worried that you, you, you know, you basically had unfettered access to it. And they were worried about benchmarks and whatnot. And I just said, look, Alex, Alex doesn't do benchmarking. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't like it. He has no interest in yeah. <laughs> uh, running 3D Mark on your card whatsoever. No, I definitely oh. don't. Um, but Will, uh, for being able to do, once again, a really high pressure job because, yeah, you can get a GPU or a CPU with a good amount of time, but sometimes you really don't. And maintaining a group of benchmarks means maintaining... I mean, for us, it depends on the outlet, but like it's maintaining a number of data sets for each benchmark for a variety of cards and maybe even like CPU permutations or memory permutations there too, uh, depending upon what you're trying to show. And that's just work I wouldn't ever want to do. And I'm happy that Will does it to the degree, to the degree of success that he has. So Will, that's for you. Cheers, mate. So Thank you. You can take up the bat on then, Will, on that one. Okay. Yeah. Why not? Um, so I wanted to shout out Oliver because his work has been so phenomenal over the past few, what, has it been about a year now since he started? More than? Just about a year. Yeah, about, yeah, yeah. just over about, uh, what would it be, like 16 months, Oliver, about something that, like yeah. that? Something like that, yeah. yeah. And just, you know, obviously his first videos were strong, but seeing his progression over, you know, those past 16 months has just been so awesome that he's kind of come in from you know not in the digital foundry mold necessarily but coming in and finding his own point of view and his own style and his own you know editing and his own everything else has just been so awesome to, to witness and he does such a good job on the direct as well like editing all that down is not an easy yes. task and <laughs> having like and to do it so quickly as well i can't yeah <laughs> absolutely so and um yeah i mean yeah I, I get what you're saying entirely and i think something i'd like to highlight is that um, i'm all about original content which isn't just taking game a that's come out in week b and doing an analysis of it um it's kind of like well what about some crazy things that we kind of think people might like to watch and every single idea no matter how crazy it's been that oliver's delivered <laughs> when i've suggested it so yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah well Thank Oliver? you very much. Um, well, I'm I'm limited at this point to one person, but <laughs> but it's a good one. <laughs> you can you can shun John. Like. <laughs> Not planning to. Uh, I love the like little flourishes and artistic touches that are all over John's pieces, and how in depth and how personal he makes his pieces, which I I really love, and I think it's like just fantastic. It really makes John's videos stand out. And also I really appreciate his just, in, I think, truly insane work ethic when it comes to churning out like 30 or 40 minute videos in very short <laughs> spans of time. Sometimes it just is mm. astounding to me, the amount of content that John can put yeah. out. That's very PSVR impressive. PSVR video, John, you, you basically turned it around in three days. Yeah, that was a, production. Yeah, was a lot of I can't even one. believe that. 
That was a mm. tough one. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, let's move on to the well, next question. I got I got to say something about so, Rich though. <laughs> yeah, come on. Come no, on. You don't have to. I do cuz Rich, Rich was the OG. Uh Rich is the reason I wanted to join this whole thing in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know, even when it was just articles written and then, you know, once you moved on to video, there's just something remarkably calming and uh very just it's so intellectually stimulating to watch a richard video you just kind of sit there sit back and just the smooth voice and all this information and it just it's very enjoyable to watch and it really makes it something special it's very different from the typical youtube kind of video where it's like hey guys we got the latest graphics card here we're gonna run it through these benchmarks and we're gonna do all it's like no richard's just he's chill and I love it. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult to actually get videos done these days because oh, of yeah. the amount of admin stuff that's going on. But yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, but we are going to move on to the next question. Um, and it's from Struggling Shader. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a great uh, Yeah. And uh, it's tying into uh, one of your recent purchases, John. And he says, John, how is your experience with a racing wheel so far? Enjoying some hardcore sims? Or only more casual <laughs> stuff. Anyone else in the team also enjoys some l- large sim gear? I think <laughs> large sim gear. Will, Tom, not only racing, but flying, also mm. flying. I, I'd love to hear stories on on some obscure peripherals that, we, that you experienced in the past. Um, John, how are you getting on with, this, with the racing wheel? You're, you're loving it, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, it's been great. I mean, the main things I've been using it, obviously Gran Turismo 7 VR, I'm doing a video on that. Yeah. That's extremely good, as you'd expect. But the thing that I've been really into, I think I mentioned this, but uh, it's uh, MAME, basically. Mm, no, really? Somebody created a sort of a, a, a driver so that you can do, not a, not a driver, mm. but they, some sort of configuration that allows you to use full force feedback with arcade games. So things like, you know, Rave Racer, Cruising USA, you know, all those, all those arcade games, Outrunners from Sega, Virtua Racing, they all just work with the force feedback wheel. And it feels like amazing to be able to play those with a wheel again on my PC. So I've been using a lot of it for that. Uh, I tried to play Forza Horizon 5 with it, and it's pretty cool, but boy, it's uh, difficult. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I need to yeah. tweak the wheel, but it's brutally hard. Like, I keep losing traction, spinning out. Like it's like, oh my god, this is this is super difficult. But apparently, there are ways to tweak it to make it a little bit uh, easier to handle. But it's uh, it's fun. I've had a wheel before. I have one that works in the PS Triple. Uh, but I got so annoyed that it didn't work <laughs> on the PS4 going forward that I just kind of like abandoned that idea for a while until a uh, PSVR2 came around. And then I was like, well, I'll give it a shot. But I know. Uh, Will uh, has more experience with racing wheels than I yeah. do. Yeah, speci- well, quote unquote, large sim gear is what uh, <laughs> Struggling Shader is interested in, and so am I. To be to be clear. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is probably against every rule, but I can slightly move over to show that that thing. Oh, wow. um, so I did the uh, an article on Eurogamer about this for, for the for the for the, uh, for the for the sake of the podcast people. What what is it that you're looking? Oh, at? sure, yeah, that that's probably not a good thing to do on an audio medium. Um, so this is a Fanatec GT DD Pro. So this was the kind of um, wheel that Fanatec put out uh, that coincided with the Gran Turismo launch on uh, PS5, mm-hmm. and it's really good. It's a direct drive wheel. I've got it hooked up to a next level racing gt track kind of cockpit thing so it's like a proper seat that you can you know move and adjust and uh, it's got a nice mount for the wheel and everything and it's so much fun it's really really immersive it's really good just having it in your room because you can just be like oh hey guys uh i see you're interested in gaming but have you ever tried it like this and then you know it's, it's good fun getting sitting someone down on you know nurburgring or whatever and just uh having them blast about and inevitably spin on the first corner so that's really good um, John, John, do you have cockpit envy? Uh, that does look pretty cool. I just don't have the room for it. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the room for it either, but I, the, still, I still have envy. it. The other peripherals, though, I would mention uh, that it were really cool is one of them was obviously St- Steel Battalion for anybody that remembers that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You guys you guys knew that, right? Yeah, of course. For the, for the original yeah. Xbox, uh, a friend of mine had that, so we played the heck out of it. But that was just, I can't even believe that exists. It was so crazy. Uh, it's it's cool. It was really cool, and I'd like to see that return, especially with like VR headsets now. That would be very immersive and cool. 
Uh, and then on the smaller side, you know, I have like so many light guns at this point that I still use in CRTs. <laughs> and I have a couple PS2s that have the Firewire port, so you can do the dual mm-hmm. link and hook up two CRTs, two PS2s, and Time Crisis 2 and 3 in two-player mode. So Wow. That's good stuff. That's hardcore. Any, any others want to chime in with some large sim gear a- anecdotes? Or should we move straight on to obscure peripherals? I mean, the most obscure peripheral I've used, I guess, is the uh, the VR system for the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis. Oh, you... I must be one of the only people in the world to have used it. It was CES 1992, and it was awful. You've not missed anything, don't worry. But it is obscure, <laughs> and it is a peripheral. Uh, any, any more for any more on this one? The Jaguar VR that came to a Jag Fest one year. Mm-hmm. Ah, so okay. it's also horrible but i'd say it's probably better than sega vr because it could actually display 3d graphics so yeah okay <laughs> fair enough uh let's move on to the next question uh this one's specific for you alex uh or what? it's from todd weitzel todd weitzel, weitzel. Is Alex the still the only person who uses the correct vertical orientation on controllers? <laughs> Todd, Todd, Todd is winding us up here because basically we share accounts yeah. on Digital Foundry and whenever Alex plays a console game and then somebody else plays it, basically it's unplayable because he's uh, shifted the... the uh, he's inverted the Y-axis yes. and it drives me mad. Yeah, same. But are, anybody, here, anybody else here using uh, inverted Y-axis? Nope. Only for flight sims. <laughs> yeah, for flight sims, yes. <laughs> Don't do you think that's interesting, though? For like, for example, if you're to play something like Battlefield and you got into a helicopter, would you want it to be inverted or would you want it to be standard? Yeah, for that I would. Oh. So that's weird, but like, but anyway, mm-hmm. who cares? Well, I don't play well, inverted mouse though. Um, uh, so if oh people God. are curious about that, uh, so I do not play <laughs> inverted mouse, either Y or X axis. Yeah. Well, weren't there games that had inverted X axis? Oh, dude, well? that was so it's common. Japanese, D- right? D- D- Japanese games during yeah. the PS2 era are horrible about this. <laughs> they have so they they constantly have reverse X axis. It's uh, it's wild. That one's not too great. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I- I'm loving this next question from the Phantom Nort. Uh, what are each of you folks' favorite DF benchmarks? Is it the Novigrad ride, <sighs> which uh, the stilled train ride with Psycho Crisis 3, the rise of the two Raider Valley Run? Wow, you remember that one, right, John? Yeah. Uh, Metro Last Light Rangers versus Red Line Attack, or is it the legendary Assassin's Creed benchmark where keys were stolen? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a benchmark that's not well known. Uh, we, meaning I, want to know. Uh, oh man, where do we begin with this one? Let's let's just limit this to the people that, that have done benchmarks. So, uh, Tom, you've done benchmarks back in the day. <laughs> any, any particular favourites? The ones which involve the least input from me, so I can do something else while it's happening, like the Skyrim one. If you remember when we had that in the uh... oh, you just start the game. Yes. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just the prisoner talking to you and leave it and just start typing on the side. I don't like yeah. the Novigrad run because it's like. Oh, it requires honestly, input. It does, and also the uh, the way the controls work in that game. It's really this horse is so stiff. Sometimes it just doesn't <laughs> want to turn, and you're like, no, I want to turn, and it bumps into an NPC, and you're like, oh, that's the whole thing messed up then, isn't it? So, uh, Skyrim, please, more Skyrim and less of uh, wonky uh, uh, horse physics. Well, you know, the modern day equivalent of that, I guess, is Dying Light 2, where the intro sequence for that is the beginning of the game. And it's mm. also uh, very brief as well. Yeah. So you don't have to wait ages like you do with the Skyrim one. And in actual fact, I prefer that sequence to the actual benchmark that they've now shipped with it, which uh, isn't great. Um, Will, man, there's, there's got to be something some that you despise by this I'm point. I'm sorry about Flight Sim. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah yeah i mean flight sim is a struggle just because every time i boot up the game it doesn't launch and i have to uninstall it and reinstall it which takes what? literally four hours yeah um, so yeah that's uh, always struggle central but um yeah i wanted to mention on the witcher 3 as well that at some point i was playing through the actual game and it said something like hold a for your horse to follow the track I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So when I came uh, to do the benchmark, I followed that strategy of holding A. And it turns out yeah. if you do that, like if somebody walks in your path, like the, the horse will just stop. And so I was trying to benchmark, you know, GPUs or whatever. Oh, no. And I would have to do like 12 runs to try and do it. 
And it wasn't until afterwards I mentioned it to Rich, like, oh, this is taking ages. How do you do it? And he's like, yeah, you just like hold forward. And I was like, oh, interesting. You don't hold A, okay. And then from that moment on, I, I loved the Witcher benchmark because it was so much more reliable. But yeah, anything that you can do without launching the game itself is amazing. Like Hitman 2 and 3 are really good. Um, I think Metro Exodus has a, has a good one. Um, yeah, and Crisis 3, I mean, you can't really get any better than Welcome to the Jungle. It's so consistent. Like, run after run, it's always, like, bang on where it was the run before, which is just so helpful. And, of course, the highly explosive materials. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah that's the best. Yeah. Oh, trying to trying to figure out what my favorite is, and I I think I am going to go with Crisis Three because we used it we used it for so long until it literally couldn't be used anymore because Windows did something weird with it. Uh, although it weirdly it still works for Will <laughs> on his CPU. Yeah, yeah tests. for some reason mm. I've never had for that issue. For some reason, so I I just can't benchmark it anymore, and it's a real shame because <laughs> I would have liked to have had a benchmark that's a through line all the way back to when we started doing proper benchmarking in like 2015, mm -hmm. even though there's, you know, it, you can talk about, about driver revisions and whatnot, but um, nobody optimizes for Crisis 3 anymore. <laughs> so, which is why, perhaps why it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. But the point, the point is that you could actually trace, you know, you can bring in that data and um, because it is so GPU bound, don't really need to worry about the CPU side of it. And, you know, you can go all the way back, you know, many, many years. Uh, but yeah, so I guess that is my favorite. I do like the Assassin's Creed Unity one, though, I have to admit. Um, oh, man. But, you know, I think these days um, we have to be a lot more selective about benchmarks, uh, particularly on the CPU side. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the crazy thing is, of course, on the CPU side that the results can change at any given point in a game. So, you, you know, you get this kind of... Uh, <laughs> often quite conflicting data from different different publications but it's it's all accurate <laughs> not yeah. ideal but but that's the way it is uh we've got a couple of questions oh. here for tom man you, Sorry, you, did you want to we didn't even talk about the geothermal valley like geothermal valley yeah the, man that was uh, interesting because that one is interesting because it's both useful on pc and consoles because mm -hmm. they kept patching the game and adding versions and adding modes and it was just uh we did so so much running through that and it was kind of a pain because you had to play through half the game to get there if you, did, yes. if you didn't have a save wow. right yeah, so the save system in that game isn't all that great either no like chapter based so that it's basically really cpu limited mm -hmm. so you could get some interesting data from that in that uh the pro consoles with the unlocked frame rates uh you could <clears> get a, a measure of the of the right. how cpu limited it was whereas on the pc yes it was also cpu limited but there were also massive di discrepancies between dx11 and dx12 um so dx12 was actually more performant but uh and it seemed to sort of hit a limit on dx11 uh another thing which was quite interesting back in the day was uh, the original hit uh, i was just consoles. thinking that yeah yeah, where essentially which whichever scenario you chose, you got a pretty good representation of being CPU limited or GPU limited. Ah, uh, yeah. And it did actually correlate with the differences in spec between the base consoles. Yep. And that, you know, the, the visual feature set was the same between Xbox One and PlayStation 4. So it was interesting to see, yes, the Xbox has a faster CPU. And yes, the PlayStation 4 has a you know, significantly faster GPU. I, I want to throw out one that's going to be a future great benchmark it's gran turismo 7 because i think that's going to come to the pc at some point mm -hmm. and even on console that had the best system ever for like saving replays and sharing them across every platform you could get those yes, pixel yeah. perfect replays oh i can't that, wait man that you could cut oh. between every you know i was able to cut back and forth with them without any crossfades or anything and it looked perfect and i'm just imagining that on the pc then you have that save that you share the replays in and you can just run that on any hardware you want and get perfect uh, race replays every single time. Yeah, replays. And um, we, we had it for a while in the benchmarks. I don't know if it's there anymore. I can't recall. It's Quake 2 RTX. Oh, uh, where, yeah. Where we would use a time demo. Time demos are yeah, essentially the time best. Demos are great oh, yeah. For yeah, time demos are great. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, of course, is we're sort of always on the lookout for games that where you can match PC with the consoles directly. Mm hmm and um and then you can kind of um replicate like for like it also requires the consoles to actually not hit their frame rate targets though <laughs> so plague tale requiem on ps5 is the latest one oh, which we can yeah. match up yeah 
interesting results there. But I am going to move on to the next question now. It's actually two questions, and they're both for Tom. <laughs> uh, first one from Dirk Hodderin. Question for Tom Morgan. Has anybody pointed out that you look like the lead singer from heavy metal band Nothing More? And uh, <laughs> I don't think anybody has until today, but it's 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 an interesting comparison. Yeah, like looking at the Google image set for was it Johnny Hawkins? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I mean, so he's a, so it's accurate, a right? Man with a beard. <laughs> I don't think I can compete with that. But the hair's similar. I was I was reminded of uh, Steve Rogers in Captain America: The First Avenger, mm -hmm. sort of like the comparison between <laughs> before and after the Super Soldier Serum. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's kind of that. <laughs> that the, the second question, uh, Thomas. This one's from Pelican Man. It's a uh, people remember a lot of information uh, about specific staff members that borders perhaps on the alarming. But here we go. Tom has shared what shampoo he uses before. Who could forget? But I think right. we'd all appreciate a more thorough walkthrough of his hair care and styling routine. I mean, how far do you want me to go? Uh, yes. Well, the, the full breakdown? You're, Maybe this should be, be a Patreon exclusive. I don't know. You're, the you're, only fans. You're, you're letting down Pelican Man if, uh, if you don't. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've got to go for it. All right. So, so I wash once a week you know hair wash <laughs> once a week and then um uh, towel dry uh every time and then conditioner with oleo curl conditioner leave-in then i take it to the hairdryer with a diffuser attachment and just go around you know get it about 75 percent dry basically and then for the last 25%, I just leave it to kind of air dry. And uh, that's that impressive. usually solves that's, it. And yeah. That sounds should like I, should I on the first share day my hair care routine? It's pretty <laughs> exciting. <laughs> <laughs> What's you doing? Uh, yeah. 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 How, how does he do it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I follow the same school of thought. Hair is annoying, so I just cut it short. <laughs> Oh, my word. Well, I, Alex, I, I can't uh, locate a specific question, but what I can say is that there were people who were asking similar questions about your uh, robust hairstyle. Oh. So would you like to, to take it, take up the mantle? Uh, well, for me, it's actually pretty simple. It doesn't require any sort of curler or a curl, any sort of iron or some sort of <laughs> things, really intense things that uh, Tom was doing. For me, it's just going to a, a nice hair place, having them cut my hair very nicely. Usually, I've been for the last, like, three years I've been getting like an undercut which I tend to like uh, and then the thing is like for hair product uh, I don't actually use gels or anything like that I find like hair powder is the best uh, which I think is usually actually some sort of sugar base which is really weird uh, but mm -hmm. basically it keeps your hair dry and uh, up and light and not like greasy looking uh, which is kind of what it's all about yeah Nice. Uh, Will, have you got any tips you'd like to share, or should we just move on? I think it's best if we if we move on. <laughs> Next question from Who the hell am I? Uh, <laughs> which hardware release have you been most hyped for Ooh. in your life? Whether it's a console, GPU, CPU, VR headset, keyboard, mouse, RGB light strip. I'm not sure if you guys are into RGB or whatever else uh, would love Ooh. to hear from everyone. Uh, Oliver, do you want to take this one? What, what, what piece of hardware has really excited you yeah. to the point of hype, hype? For me, it would probably be, be the Xbox 360. At the time I was like, really? yeah, I was like wow. 10 years old. He's young. <laughs> and and I remember uh, being super excited for it and reading all of like the early press for it and reading about how like Oblivion would be on it. And it, it just looked so exciting at the time and reading all about Gears. And um, that ended up obviously being a very defining, I think, machine uh, on the seventh generation of console hardware and sort of, I think, the key mm -hmm. console that generation. And uh, it was only cemented when like a couple weeks before release, I got a chance to play King Kong at like a demo kiosk at EB Games, which is a Canadian game retailer. And even though King Kong is probably not the most defining Xbox 360 launch title, it, it sold me on it for sure. I would love to do that for a DF Retro Let's Play PC Time Capsule because that's like PS2, Xbox 360, GameCube, PC, right? Xbox. GameCube. It's yeah. it'd be amazing for that. Yeah, they're all different. Mm. Okay, who wants to go next, John? Sure. Uh, probably the PSP. 
because uh, oh, okay. I was completely enamored with that idea at the time. Cause I was getting back into handheld games and just seeing what that thing could do. It felt like a magical device from the future. <clears throat> and as a huge Ridge Racer fan, you know, having another Ridge Racer at launch and then stuff like Luminous. And I mean, if you saw Ridge Racers running on a PSP hardware in 2004 or 2005, there, it was. I mean, surely some of you guys remember this. It, it looked. Yeah, it was incredible. There was. I, I imported one from Japan. There was nothing like that at the time. And in fact, you play Ridge Racers right now, even blown up, it still looks good, right? It's a game you could put out on like the Switch, and it would not look like horribly out of place. So the fact that they were doing that almost twenty years ago in a portable system uh, is completely wild. Nice. Mm, okay. Uh, Alex, you must have an interesting insight into this one. Yes. Well, um, for me, it's the 8800 GT launch because I was for a long time Ooh. gaming on an X800 XT, which is an ATI card, um, shader model 9.0B. And I was uh, I was so psyched for Crisis. Uh, <laughs> oh. And I just, uh, I played the demo of Crisis. I've talked about this before on the X800 XT. And then, uh, and it was 20 FPS, 800 by 600, and it looked awful. But it was like one of the most amazing experiences in my life just because how interactive the world even was on this, you know, pretty old PC for the time period. And then I was just hyping it up, wanted to get that 8800 GT, and then I got an 8800 GT SLI system. And even though Crisis made it cry, literally, uh, still, uh, it was a pretty good experience at 1024 by 768 and I saw and did things with that PC that changed my life. So uh, I love that card. It's a great GPU. Just trying to process a PC that's literally crying. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's just like literally, literally leaking. leaking. It's leaking. <laughs> yeah. uh, Will, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I was thinking about this and there's definitely some old PC hardware that could probably take it. I think Ryzen 3000 probably gets an honorable mention because it was like the first time where it was like, oh, holy crap, they're actually going to fight Intel and it's actually going to maybe work. Yeah, and that's great. That was super cool. Um, but I think for me, probably like the PS5 and Series X uh, were the biggest really? ones. Wow. Just because they finally brought over the two best features or two of, of some of the best features from PC, which is SSDs and 120 hertz support mm -hmm. because for so long i would be like playing on my pc super happy and somebody would be like oh you need to check out this game on like you know ps4 or whatever it's really good and i would go over there and i'd be like oh this is really good but it takes like 30 minutes to like load or <laughs> it felt like it anyway and you know it was just a, such a different experience and you couldn't get that crisp you know responsiveness if you're playing at you know 30 fps or 60 fps so the fact that i can now go to my ps5 or my series x and just be like oh yeah this is like loading super fast this is like super responsive if i set it to the right mode it's like so nice it's all that i really appreciate about pc games so having it on console is just like spot on love it nice okay um who's left tom well, I think I've got to go back to uh, the Mega Drive because, uh, like, when I was ten, this was the big console for me. Was, I don't think there's any any comparison, honestly. Oh yeah, it was like the sort of situation where I was ten years old, and I was just shaking at the sight of getting this thing just on my birthday. I can't tell you how excited I oh, was just to to get this, awesome. and obviously it was, uh, wow. you know, yeah. Sonic One two three and sonic and knuckles it was such a big deal and uh, to be honest i don't think there's much that can really rival you know those childhood memories that really is like the peak you know in terms of your excitement uh, for all this sort of thing yeah i think you're right i mean from my perspective it's difficult because uh, it's been a job for me since 1990 uh, but if we go before that, the first one that really excited me, I guess, was the Atari VCS, the 2600 wow. with Space Invaders. Space Invaders was just like so colossal at the time. Um, and then moving forward from that, the next thing I was excited about, I mean, I, I, I did like the Spectrum. I really liked the Commodore 64. The Amiga I, I liked but didn't love. We, we've seen then you then play Manic Miner, Rich. Well, yeah, that. well, there we go. Mm -hmm. uh, That's impressive. The, um, the, I was, I mean, my first job interview, I saw the Mega Drive, which just completely blew me away because it was doing things that nothing I'd, I'd seen at home was doing. And um, 
Most recently, yeah, I see what you're saying about the PSP. But when you were there in 1994 for the arrival of the uh, the PlayStation and you saw a Ridge Racer. Yeah, that's true. That was a moment, right? And then it was, in actual fact, the week before that was uh, not, it wasn't quite there, but Virtua Fighter on the Saturn was also like tremendous. But it was the, the Ridge Racer moment. I don't think we've had anything quite like that since... Mm-hmm. Since that, I think we've covered everyone now. Um, but yeah, some some great hardware there, some great moments. Um, let's move on to the next question. This one from Mecca Madam Donut. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a PC gamer for as long as I can remember, but I've lately found myself opting for the use of playing on PS5 lately due to all of the subpar PC ports. And while I do miss raid facing, I find myself making more time to play on consoles. Have recent PC struggles? made any of you start playing more games on console? Interesting question, right? Because, you know, we're at this sort of point where um, games are kind of targeting those machines now. They're targeting them at 60 frames per second. You might not have raid facing. You might not have a super smooth frame rate. But if you're in a living room, sitting far away from the screen with a VRR display, a lot of the traditional issues with a console kind of become less of an issue. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, who wants to tackle this one? Uh, John, you, you're, you've you been sort of getting back into PC gaming recently, right? Yeah. Um, the main thing for me is just getting a comfortable setup, I guess. And like, you know, as I wrote about that chair, like just getting a good comfy chair really kind of brought me back to the PC because that was kind of the thing that's missing. Mm-hmm. Uh, since I mostly, you know, I have a standing desk here and I, I work a lot of times standing, but now I kind of go back and forth between chair and standing and when i game i definitely go with the chair so but, but what about the concept of the consoles basically covering the the essentials and doing a good job to the point where you don't have to worry uh, about i think it just depends on your tastes but i think they all have their purpose like i actually use all the different platforms depending on what my needs are like if i wanted to play in the evening or something to wind down i'm less likely to fire up the pc uh, because it's just easier to have the console <clears throat> up and turn it off and not have to go through the shutdown process. Like, little things like that, but it's just enough where it's like, oh, yeah, I'll just do the console. Or, you know, the retro stuff as well. That's So I think they're all valid, but I can totally see someone being perfectly happy with the console, as well as somebody that's perfectly happy with the PC. It's all valid. So... Mm-hmm. Is anyone here is kind of migrated from PC to console? Because, Will, you you were sort of super PC, but you did start playing some console. Yeah, I mean, it's just about the games that are available on, on console. And I think nowadays, you know, both Microsoft and Sony have shown a lot of uh, interest in porting to PC eventually. So I've kind of adopted a kind of wait and see kind of mindset. Maybe I'll, you know, play GT7 because I'm super into it and my friends are playing it. Um, and F1 2022, F1 2022 is yeah. kind of similar. But um, yeah, otherwise, I'm still kind of a diehard PC fanatic. I kind of perversely enjoy all the kind of weird settings tweaks that you need to do. <laughs> is the satisfaction of getting it right and having it be smooth and perfect is just un- unparalleled. I, w- I will nice. say that our pre-release access to PC games has proven very useful to me in terms of deciding if I want to play it on PC or not, because it's usually pretty evident right away. Like, oh, this is a, yeah. a bad... Like Callisto yeah. Protocol, for instance... It's like you five know, minutes. Uh, it was pretty obvious at the beginning, like, oh, okay, I would not be happy playing this on PC. Yeah, so, it's like, right? I, get a, I get a DM from John. It's like, stutter? Question mark? I'm yeah. Like, yeah. 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 With, with, with me, I actually tend every generation to kind of slide back and forth a bit. As the generation mm-hmm. progresses, I move more and more over to PC as like the consoles fall behind the leading edge of uh, real-time rendering technology. But definitely mm-hmm. the fact that a lot of PC titles right now are just not in a good place means that you have to be a lot more selective than I think you used to be. Like That's the only not nice. PC yeah. titles that I really want to play are games that actually take advantage of the platform, that can actually give me an experience that's much better than console, and don't have massive stuttering problems or something. So like Cyberpunk, Dying Light, Control, everything else is just like... Usually I'd rather just play it on console at this point at least. Maybe later on, not so much, but right now. Yeah, I've definitely moved over to the console side myself as well, just in the last six to seven years. I think just for the low bar of um, entry, the the threshold, if you like, to just get into the experience without any 
issues holding me back and not to mention the OLED. I know you can get an OLED for PC, but still it's set up in the living room. And uh, obviously the kind of exclusive situation on console, the Sony exclusives especially, it kind of has uh, made a good argument for me just to stay with consoles Mm -hmm. So, Alex, I've got to come to you on this one because, uh, well, there's a meme going around at the moment, which is showing Pedro Pascal from The Last of Us yes. looking in various states of despair. <laughs> uh, I have and seen tiredness it. and weariness. <laughs> and uh, towards the end of last year, that was before you were re renewed, mm -hmm. th this was you, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, I'm also, at least in terms of AAA... Triple A outings on PC are right now in a in a place that's pretty dark, just because you just don't know ever. <laughs> One, you should never pre-order games, I don't think, in general, um, uh, because you don't know about the quality until it comes out. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> wait a little bit for like reviews and benchmarks and all these other things. But right now, it's like a really dark period where, like for example, I just want to use Dead Space here as an example, where if you look at the user reviews on Steam, it's like. 80% positive maybe or something like that and I'm just thinking like is everyone not seeing what I'm seeing that happens on every PC out there even big ones and it's like it's it's like hard to trust user reviews it's hard to trust companies that are putting the games out because they're willing to put out things like Callisto Protocol at times um, so it's a really rough spot I wouldn't I wouldn't go over to console just because I have like a very like specific set of requirements for playing a game I like keyboard and mouse like a lot <laughs> um and other things like that like returnal for me is just revelatory on a keyboard and mouse right now uh but at the same time i don't have a problem waiting for triple a games to get better or just never playing them because my favorite games on pc actually tend to not be like the stuff that are console ports they're pretty pc specific titles usually yeah. alex by the way you mentioned yeah. that do the people not see the problem i think yeah. in a lot of cases they actually don't yeah. Like they they genuinely yeah. don't detect it or don't care, so that's probably it. You're right. right? Like not everybody is is that sensitive to it. It can be a curse sometimes. <laughs> it's probably a curse <laughs> in my case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, next question from Concrete Llama with episode 100 coming up. I thought I'd take a look back at all the DF Direct weekly wow. episodes you've done. <laughs> I've watched them all since they began, and they have since discovered that I've spent in total five days. 22 hours, 22 minutes, and 34 seconds. Thank you, Concrete Lava. Watch, watching DF Direct Weekly. Good Lord. That's a lot of content. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if you have any fun Digital Foundry stats to spare. So I have gone into the uh, into YouTube's analytics portal. Ooh. Uh, the top video in terms of views that we've ever done was the Grand Theft Auto 5 <laughs> PS4 <ton> of... <laughs> PSC trailer comparison. Wow. 8.2 no. million. That's followed by Grand Theft Auto 5, Xbox 360 versus PS3 gameplay <laughs> frame rate tests, 3.87 million views. Uh, the next uh, video, which is probably the first one I'm actually proud to be in the top 10, is uh, Alex's Crisis oh, yeah. 10 oh, on. What is it at right now? Why, why it's still melting the most powerful gaming PCs, 2.07 million awesome. views. Awesome, Heck yeah. That's nice. Yeah. The next one is the video we, you know, maybe we should just delete it at this point because it winds us up whenever we see it. It's the neat, the, the, the speed most wanted. Is this PS3 versus Vita comparison video? Yeah. We can't get rid of that. Two point, it's a classic. <laughs> Two point zero six million views. This is something I just knocked up in a, in like an hour, and uh, there it is. Um, yeah, then it's more GTA Five. Um, why you shouldn't install the GTA 5 play disc on Xbox 360, oh, 1.7 million. GTA 5, man. Um, um, yeah, I could go on. What's... Battlefield 4, PlayStation 4 versus Xbox One comparison. That's the one you did back in the day from the press trip, Tom. Tom, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. 1.69 million views, man. which we, we will probably have to tell the uh, the story of that one day. But basically, we had no idea whether the HDMI ports of the consoles were protected oh, or not. Oh, yeah. And we basically sent Tom to Sweden armed with every conceivable HDMI device and a full PC and a monitor. Mm. <laughs> and so, uh, some, oh, my God. A couple more that I'm going to highlight. But yeah, man, uh, that was that was quite an, a, an exhibition, that one, wasn't it? I remember um, it was funny. I've, I've told this story many times in the past, but everybody could see that the Xbox One version wasn't as clear as the PS4 version, and they were kind of asking you for confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite amusing. 
uh, a couple of ones that uh, that creep into the top ten that I'm very happy about. Um, Gran Turismo Sport versus Forza Motorsport Classic. Seven. Oh, yeah. could, could have been could have been a toxic disaster of a video, but you did a great job. It's 1.6 million views you, there. You got to do it again, John. Oh, I'm going to do it this year. It's going to be so good. And <laughs> um, coming in at number ten, we have uh, from Tom Morgan, Cyberpunk 2077 ps4 versus ps4 pro performance yeah i think with cyberpunk it was the first one we had come in and also the question everyone had on their lips you know what's uh, the state of last gen and i don't believe we had xbox one code at that point so we kind of mm-hmm. led on that and i guess <laughs> yeah um but yeah interesting stats there but it is interesting to note that um you know we're talking a range of 1.54 million to 8.2 million and this is our you know our most popular stuff and you know when you compare it to what some of the pc tech channels are pulling in we're, we're not in that <laughs> we're not bracket bad. at all but i don't think we want to be in, to, in that bracket no really. no rich i think one of the weirdest ones if you sort by watch time the the okay the number three one is is that playstation 3 game still worth playing live stream that i did oh yeah, wow really? like, what, i have no idea what it at, I, I, I did not was expect to see long? it up there. Yeah, it was three hours forty two minutes. But <laughs> just under that is the is the DF Retro on Doom, which is a good one. Well, yeah, nice. That's but a, yeah, it's there's long ones. videos. Obviously, they they kind of dominate that. So you want stats? We we have stats for you, and um, not quite as good as yours though, Concrete Llama. I know. Ooh, I've got to, some to stats aggregate too. all of the Oof, DF Direct. It's a lot. All yeah, ninety nine. I guess at that point, wow. Um, next question from E305. I, w- I want to believe <laughs> this must be a, a triple reference. Yeah. It's got to be. Uh, c- c- congratulations on reaching 100, double exclamation point. Listening to the podcast version of DF Direct during my commute, commute is one of the highlights of my week. John, loved your recent DF retro play of Goldeneye with Mark from My Life in Gaming. Oh, yeah. How did you guys end up meeting originally? And is there any retro hardware or games that Mark and Corey have that you are especially jealous of oh man <laughs> uh i get to know them simply because so they do this live stream thing every sunday night and then they you know they ask different people to join on just for guests and they asked me of course but i was like ah, i'm in germany and it's sunday night it's pretty difficult but i'll be back in the u.s soon uh when i'm in cincinnati i'll let you know and they were like that's where Corey lives he's in cincinnati as well so it was like oh okay so we just basically met up that year and uh kind of became friends from then and yeah obviously mark is part of that as well uh i did get to finally go to mark's house last year so i've seen them both and i can say that i'm envious of the amount of space they have to dedicate towards their setups (laughs) also so Corey is insane with hooking stuff up like having every monitor go to every place in this giant basement area like i do a lot of that but he's gone so far like there's there's got to be 20 or 30 displays down there from crts to to oleds to lcd monitors that are all connected to one another so you can basically stream and film from like anywhere in that studio send audio send video all over the place it's completely ridiculous so yeah plus uh, they have dedicated filming setups for filming b-roll whereas i have to assemble and disassemble mine every freaking time because I don't know the. So it's not exactly a, 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 any games or hardware. You're, no, you're no, no. Of, just their technical setup. Yeah, exactly. Just their setups. Okay. Uh, next question from Joe Tanko at Oliver. <laughs> what did you think, being relatively new in DF back in August twenty two, that you'd already be quoted by the BBC <laughs> for your opinion on Mario Kart eight? Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty. That was kind of good. Yeah, it's you know it's pretty cool. Um, it's pretty cool, but what I found amusing was the quote they pulled from my piece, which is that I said the best Mario Kart 8 tracks combine challenging sets of fast corners with extended anti-gravity sections, multiple viable routes, and track hazards. Most of the new tracks are sedate in comparison with laid-back layouts, less interesting <laughs> track features, and little in the way of vehicle transformations. So they took, like, I have, like, this whole piece, like, 99% of it is just about the graphics. But like their piece is all about just like general Mario Kart 8 problems and Nintendo chasing success or something. And they just pulled yeah, out yeah. this section on gameplay, which was much shorter. So I thought that was funny. It's like they 
it's the most uncharacteristic part of the piece is when I complain about the layouts. But, yeah. Possibly the only bit they could really understand. Probably, yeah. Uh, Maybe. Extremely cool. <laughs> Harsh. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question from F to the G. A question for Alex. <laughs> Rich mentioned your flawless German in an episode last year, and as a native speaker, I have to agree. In fact, I always was 100% certain you are a native fact, speaker as well. So are you? Question mark. And if not, <laughs> why slash how slash when <laughs> did you end up in Germany? I hope this is not too personal. Oh, and congratulations fine. to the hundred. Yes, yes, the hundredth episode of your weekly show. To one hundred more brilliant episodes. I, I love. So I think they're looking for your uh, your Teutonic origin story. Teutonic origin story. <laughs> well, I moved to Germany thirteen years ago. Uh, I, I'm feeling a little bit old when I say that now, actually now. Uh, it's hard to actually imagine, but I'm not technically a native speaker, but I started learning it when I was younger. And uh, I have a degree in Germanistic, so I uh, had to do all that stuff. I, I have a degree in political science uh, done at the Freie Universität. So it's basically the level of German that I was required to do those things. Um, required me to have like a native level. It doesn't mean I'm perfect or something like that. Uh, I think I do do a really, really good job, but it's mostly there. It's virtually um, perfect. It's virtually perfect. Um, most people don't uh, know when I'm speaking to them for long periods of time, unless we talk about something extremely specific that I couldn't possibly know about. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but then again, I think that's for the most people in every single language out there. Yep. Uh, and what else is the part of the question? No, it's not too personal. But I just don't talk about it too much because I think, uh, you know, there's like associations and all those other things about where you come from. And I just like being an international man of mystery usually. Yeah. Okay. I mean... Just uh, an Alex an anecdote when we were in Berlin together for the Intel uh, interview. Um, at dinner, Tom Peterson was literally sat in front of me telling me all of this amazing backstories <laughs> from his days at NVIDIA. And you were talking to some, uh, I think it was the computer based guys in German. Mm -hmm. You literally missed all of those anecdotes. <laughs> yeah, I missed them all. But the computer case base uh, guy, I, I, don't, I doubt they're watching this, but they also had a lot of war stories that they were going over, as well as all Ooh. the people from Intel, uh, from the German wing, that were really nice too. <laughs> so best of both worlds mm -hmm. then. Yeah, yeah. Always. We, we, we got, between us, we got all the stories. <laughs> we have all the stories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next question uh, from Eric Benoit. I want to thank DF for the honor of supporting such a wonderful team of analysts. <laughs> Might be over baking it, but I'll take it. Uh, my question would be, what have you learned about the people in the supporter program that has surprised you? Uh, I'm going to take this one first. And basically, um, before we did the supporter program, our exposure to social media was actually quite negative overall. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd log on to Twitter and there'd be like a, a rump of people that loved what you do, but it was just spoiled by uh, abuse and uh, which continues to this day but you know not quite to the level of the death threats that we had at one point um but the point is that um the this is kind of applies to all of the people in the supporter program particularly those who participate in the discord in the discord is um we have a refuge where we have a really positive community a positive environment um people helping each other people helping the team and um the 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 sort of uh, benefits to mental health and stuff that this has brought uh, to me and I know to the other members of the team has been um, very surprising and actually extremely rewarding. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, who's contributed to that. Uh, anybody else want to add anything to this? Any any <laughs> supporter surprises mm. to add to uh, the mix? I mean, I would say that they've all just been extremely supportive and kind and just like awesome to talk with lots of knowledgeable people there from all over the place. You know, when things were really dire for me last fall, I had so many people reaching out and just lots yeah, of, it was very nice. Like, they were, they were really awesome. And also understanding that people kept supporting the retro stuff, despite the fact that due to that issue, I was very late with some videos, but they did eventually get made, but yeah, I'm just amazed at the kindness and, uh, how awesome the community is and they're all able to talk about even like somewhat sometimes dicey subjects and it never blows up it's always very respectful and and thoughtful conversation in there which is great mm. 
any more for any more on this one i mean um will you basically set up the discord which made all of this happen yeah uh any, any observations on this i mean just the creativity of the people in the discord absolutely blew me away you know the designs that we've seen like the memes the merch ideas stuff like that has yeah, just been that's, that's that's been brilliant so good like i never expected to have so much um concentrated brilliance in 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 such a small place so Thank you guys, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. That's just been brilliant. Um, let's move on to the next question. This one from Lil Gohan. Uh, to Rich, what do you look for when hiring for DF? Uh, well, basically um, it's extremely difficult, right? Because if you think about the, the skills that you need to do the job, you need to have the ability to analyze a game or to, you know, to assess and review a game. This in itself is a hugely difficult task you have to be able to write and communicate that's another extremely difficult um skill that you know it doesn't just come naturally for most people you have to be a video editor you have to know how to use a camera you have to know how to use our arcane tools mm -hmm. and to know when you know uh, an analysis is actually incorrect um you know it helps if you can do pixel counting which you know is extremely difficult um so I'm looking for all of those things, but basically the thing that I really look for is, uh, and this is something which applies to everybody that I'm talking to at the moment um, in this stream, is you have to be able to do something that I can't. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the barometer of greatness. If you're able to do something I can't, you know, some fairly good all rounder, I'd say, <laughs> but you know, each of the members of the team here has got an X factor that I don't have, right? And being able to have that diversity of talent within the team is um, it's rarer than gold dust. It's, you know, it's it's extremely difficult to find people. What's actually good for us is that we do actually have a global platform. So when people do want to contribute, they, you know, they they do reach out, probably not with the frequency I would like, you know, and by all means, if you if you meet all of this incredible criteria, please get in touch. But yeah, that's what I'm looking for there. And um, I guess that leads us on to the final question from Thomas Briggs, which is, I wish I had a question. <laughs> Just want to say thanks for making amazing videos. Uh, nice. You're welcome. Um, any final thoughts from anyone, John? Uh, I mean, it's been... 10 years for me now this starting this year right around mm -hmm. this time almost so it's been a long crazy journey with lots of ups and downs that's for sure but uh you, it's been it's been a pleasure and i want to say that richard is the best boss i've ever had by like a million miles yeah. it's like i had some i had a lot of different bosses prior and uh the experiences were always not the best sometimes okay but richard is uh man there's, there's nobody quite like Rich. Well, I appreciate that. But I also appreciate 10 years of doing Digital Foundry, right? And um, we have obligations as, as uh, you know, as bosses to um, appreciate that amount of time that's been put in and to figure that, you know, so much of your effort goes in, so much of your lifespan yeah. has gone into Digital Foundry. <laughs> a, we've got to respect that. And B, we've got to work to make conditions and things like that, mm -hmm. you know, good. So we can actually, you know, you're, if we're part of your life, this is going crazy in terms of depth, but if we're part of this massive part of your life journey, then we have to sort of step up and be the best facilitators, bosses, whatever you want to call it, that we can possibly be. Um, and I'm always wanting to do better on that. Uh, any more thoughts, Alex? Um, for me, I've been... 2018 i looked actually i was filling out taxes because that's what you do um but i had to look i had to look back and see when i started at working for df and i was because i basically corona was this, this big blind spot for me every single yep. i can't even remember 2020 let alone 2021 anymore <laughs> um and i had to look back and it's, um i had a letter uh addressed from rich uh that was i think it's like it's like February the 12th or maybe it was 13th of 2018 uh, and it was talking about getting me on board and I had already recorded with you in Frankfurt the um, the really cool I think it was looking back at E3 2005 
what? Yeah, it was basically the fakery of the, the triple yeah, reveal. Yeah, the fakery, the triple, triple oh, reveal. Yeah. And it's been five years then, that means, for me at DF, which is, uh, this is the longest I've ever worked a single job. And this is um, also, I have to concur with John about the boss. Uh, this is the most pleasant job experience I've ever had. Um, I'm also really <laughs> grateful for DF Direct because um, uh, I think during the corona you know, like the height of the pandemic, it was a great way to be social when I really couldn't be uh, mm -hmm. in other ways. And I think that our community does that for me really well. I've talked about this with a lot of people. I've become more insular in life just because of the pandemic and not being able to re-socialize very well. But I would say our community and my coworkers have made me feel like a part of like an active social community constantly where I'm writing to them and speaking to John and Rich on a daily basis always. Uh, it really helps and it, it's great. I love it. I love DF. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, who wants to go next? Tom, you've been here longer than anybody except me. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, first I will say a huge <laughs> thanks to you, Rich, for taking me on all those years ago. I, I like, uh, it was 2011. I just got out of uni, um, you know, fresh faced, didn't know what uh, to do next. And I threw my hat into the ring with uh, an application you put out on Eurogamer uh, to, you know, staff up the DF ranks. And yeah, it's been quite a ride uh, ever since 12 years. It'll be in September this year. And uh, yeah, I can't, I'm, I'm so grateful to have the job. I think it's uh, become a huge part of my life. Obviously, it's uh, it's ingrained in what I do day to day, and it's um, mm -hmm. kind of hard to imagine life without it. it you know, it's it's so uh, becomes so much a part of who I am. Hundred shows in the bag. Will any final thoughts? <laughs> um, I, I think a lot of great things have already been said. Um, that I'd like to echo. Just you know, you guys are the best to work with definitely the best job I've ever had. It's wonderful to be with so many people that are all interested in their own things and really passionate about what they do. And I think that definitely comes across. And equally, the community is just, you know, so precious. I really love hearing from people. So, you know, if you want to DM me on Twitter or send me a message on the Discord, I'm genuinely really happy to, to talk to people because it makes my job a lot easier, actually, you know, knowing what people are, you know, have questions about or interested in. So yeah, thank you guys. It's it's been absolutely lovely, and yeah, here's to a hundred more. Oliver, you get to have the final word. Oh, yeah. Well, I haven't yeah. been here for. It's kind of crazy. I mean, you edit DF Direct now. Uh -huh. Took over from Audi when he moved on to Limited Run Games. Hundred episodes in the bag. You've done. I don't know how many you've done at this point, but it's, it must be 40 getting on for forty-ish. So. Yeah. Yeah. Machine. Final thoughts. Yeah. I mean, it's been super fun so far. It's almost always quite enjoyable uh, final, <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost, always, you know, almost always quite enjoyable uh, working on my pieces and I'm looking forward to hopefully filing many more and uh, mm -hmm. keeping on top of interesting work covering maybe <laughs> some more troubled releases those are always fun to do and uh, <laughs> well I mean I think the thing to, that I really like is that you're always you know I would go spare at some of the stuff that you've looked at I would not I would not be as kind or as possibly as objective as you yeah. in looking at stuff like Pokemon. Oh, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, it's geez. it's it's fun to do those videos sometimes. It's also fun to do videos where the quality of the work is uh, exceptional, of course, but a, a good mix is always interesting. And uh, and coming up with like more offbeat uh, video concepts and executing those, especially when like the content is really dry and you have to really stretch yourself. That's yeah, fun. I mean, there's been some great stuff. I think I mentioned that earlier. Another one that springs to mind with, was the um, the Mac stuff you've done, right? Oh, yeah, that was fun. Where this is an interesting scenario where, um, you know, the the enthusiast Mac sites and, and channels don't really do what we do. So to bring our disciplines to those uh, to those titles, to actually see stuff like Stutter struggle with some <laughs> evil was on the back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. the or the uh, that was kind of very crazy. high quality up sampler that Apple yeah, shipped. That, oh, yeah. that no yeah, one that was I mean oh, totally yeah, off the radar, one. but yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah. And uh, it was great to see the response from Apple on social media to yeah. say, Hey, we've been we've actually had our work noticed <laughs> by, you know, authorities in, in this kind of thing. I thought that was fantastic. So yeah, there's just so much to, to celebrate there. Um I'm gonna end. Will's actually put up a message on the uh, on the discord chat with more stats mm -hmm. so concrete llama i hope you're still watching um uh, 
we've got 1,219 Digital Foundry benchmark graphs on Eurogamer. I think that's the case, right, Will? Uh, I think it's uh, 1,219. 19. Yep. Two to 60 configurations tested. Yep. <laughs> Some, what does that mean? Well, sometimes we're just comparing two uh, systems, you know, like ah, okay. uh, setting on, yes, setting yes, off. Yes. And sometimes it's like we have literally, you know, maybe 20 CPUs three time, <laughs> uh, at three different resolutions, something like that. Oh, my so, God. Uh, the next stat, uh, 2005 Digital Foundry videos on DF.net. That's the high quality video downloads. When did we uh, which is when did we start that again? Wow. When, what was the first? It would have been um, November 2016 yeah. was for the, uh, oh, the, the Ford right. Pro. For the professional. Yes, Ford yeah, so everything prior yeah. to that is not on the FTP, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting about that is that I happen to uh, have learned that Concrete Llama has downloaded all 2,005 of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's have a look. 3,076 tagged Digital Foundry articles on Eurogamer. That's a lot of work. There's a Good lot Lord. of stuff that happened before we went video, right? Um, we have, is that right? 8,826 patrons? Yeah, this is I the number we... of people are registered on uh, patreon.com as having at some point supported us. So that's active ah, and past. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Of which 2,347 are active, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is pretty awesome. I just can't get my head around that. It's, it's actually been crucial to it uh, has yeah to the financial viability of the of the business. It was something we should talk about. Maybe is that there was actually a, a Reddit post recently about how we don't have so many sponsored inserts and ads and how we're throwing away a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, but you know it's it's not through choice. I mean we would like to be more commercially viable. But the point is that when we've got. 2,347 people supporting us every month. Um, it makes the difference, right? It's a, it's a big deal. Oh, yeah. And, fin and finally, uh, 1,426 Discord members. And Will's put in brackets, call for action, join us. <laughs> join us. Uh, and um, yes, join us. I mean, of those 2,347 active uh, patrons, all of you can actually access the Discord server, and I invite you to do so. And our supporter program, you know, the, the Discord side of things is is crucial to that. So yes, um, I guess that just gives me a perfect segue to finish the uh, to finish the show. Mm -hmm. And it's been a, awesome to have all of you with me with me on this one. And it's it's just been fantastic to to do an extended episode. I'm sorry about the fact that it is extended, Oliver, as you're doing the edit. <laughs> Take your time, Oliver. It's okay. No rush. <laughs> But anyway, if you did enjoy this uh, 100th episode of DF Direct Weekly, please do uh, like, subscribe, share, ring the bell for those. I, I was going to say notionally instant. I am I am relatively satisfied now that they are instant notifications <laughs> because I keep getting notifications from that channel that I really don't like that one of you <laughs> six people subscribed me to. <laughs> Soon. Yeah. Uh, bell ringing instant notifications it is a thing yeah and we've talked about the uh, support program in depth so please do consider that but that's all from us for this 100th episode thanks for watching